Okay, good morning and welcome everyone to the Board of Environmental Safety meeting. Uh, my name is Jessica Swan, and I'm a specialist with the Department of Toxic Substances Control. I will be assisting with facilitating today's meeting. This meeting is being recorded and by your continued participation is acknowledgement that you are being recorded. Today is July 12th, 2022 and the time is 10.03 um, and the meeting is now called to order. Thank you, Jessica. Will you please call the roll? Thank you. Uh, Jeannie Rizzo? Present. Shishma Bhatia? Present. Georgette Gomez? Present. Alexis Strauss-Hacker? Present. Uh, Lizette Ruiz? Present. We have five of uh, five members present and a quorum is established. So next slide, please. So I will review some logistical information for today's meeting. So today's meeting is being live streamed and recorded. We have English and Spanish call-in lines for remote participation. So if you would like to participate by phone, um, the phone numbers are on your screen now. Um, and the code again for, for both lines is 9312824. For those who have joined in person, we have interpreters at the back right corner of the room. Um, and if you would prefer to hear this uh, meeting in Spanish, if you can make your way uh, to that area and they will assist you. So I will now have one of our Spanish interpreters come on to the English line and provide instructions to our Spanish participants on how to um, call in to the Spanish call in line. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, so, and thank you to um, Brittany and um, Sergio, who are our interpreters today. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so meeting materials are available on the BES website in English and Spanish. The website is bes.dtsc.ca.gov. Um, so I would like you all to take a moment to look around you and identify the nearest exit to you. Um, it may be behind you. So in the event of a fire alarm, we are required to evacuate the room. While staff will endeavor to assist you to the nearest exit, you should find the exit door that's closest to you and the exit signs are mounted on the wall. Um, should we have to relocate outside of the building, please obey all traffic signals and exercise caution when crossing the street. Um, restrooms are located outside of the room and to the right. Um, the, the board will break for lunch for an hour around noon to one o'clock and we'll have take a rest break around 3 p.m. Um, these times may fluctuate to accommodate the agenda items. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you so much. So um, there will be many opportunities throughout this meeting for public comment. Um, if you have joined us in person, there are comment cards outside on the desk where you signed in. Um, please complete one comment card for each agenda item that you would like to comment on. Um, so this meeting is being broadcast to YouTube and to participate in the actual in the actual meeting, you will need to dial in at the time that you want uh, to make your comment or stay dialed in the entire time. So again, the numbers are on your screen. Okay, um, so when you dial in, if you have joined by phone, you'll press star one to join the queue during the agenda item that you would like to provide comment. Please provide your name and affiliation at the prompt. Um, if you would like to withdraw your comments, you can press star two. If you would like to express your comments in writing, please email besinfo at bes.dtsc.ca.gov. We ask that it is that when it is your opportunity to comment, that you speak at an even pace to ensure that all participants are able to hear and understand you. Uh, comments for most comment periods will be limited to two minutes, but that could change at the discretion of the board chair. Uh, those joining in person, um, for, the, for those 
For those of us joining us, um, we will let you know when there are 30 seconds remaining and also when time expires. Um, time will be doubled for participants expressing their comments in Spanish. If you are in person today and providing a comment in Spanish, please pause every few sentences to allow the interpreter time to interpret your comment. So that concludes our review of the logistics for this afternoon's meeting. I will now turn it over to uh, Chair Rizzo. Madam Chair. Thank you, Jessica, and welcome to the Board of Environmental Safety's first full board meeting on location here in Montebello. We appreciate all the effort and support for this meeting provided by the City of Montebello and the DTSC staff who have supported us during the last several months as we uh, onboarded ourselves and started to hire staff. So I want to thank you all. This may be the last time we see some of you managing our meetings, but um, you are much appreciated. The DTSC team made it possible for us to honor our commitment to hold at least three meetings per year, not in Sacramento, where communities have experienced the direct impact of the toxic exposures that are under the jurisdiction of the Department of Toxic Substances Control, and to reach out to community members and organizations in those locales. So I want to thank you all who made this work. Many of you are in the audience. Others of you I know are on the phone. We'll move to the agenda now, after which I will provide a uh, short report. Thank you. Jessica? Thank you so much, uh, Madam Chair. So we are now going to have our first public comment period. It is going to be a public comment period for items not on the agenda. Um, we will have about 15 minutes for public comments at this time. We will also have an additional opportunity for public comment um, that for items not on the agenda. Additionally, m uh, um, several of our agenda items will have comment periods for that specific agenda item. So again, this is just for items not on the agenda. Um, so again, if you have joined us in person, you can complete a comment card, which is found at the front, um, which is found at the front where you signed in. Um, if you have joined by phone, you will dial the number on your screen for the specific language that you would like to comment through, and you will press star one to join the queue. Um, so please provide your name and any affiliation at the prompt. Again, you can press star two to withdraw your comment. And if you would like to express your comment in writing, you can email us at besinfo at bes.dtsc.ca.gov. So we will start our um, comment period with the comment cards. We will then move to our English call in line, our Spanish call in line, and then any folks in the audience who would also like to comment but have not completed a comment card, we will address those um, after. So the first comment that I have is Angela Johnson Maceros. Hello. Awesome. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Angela Johnson Mazaros. I'm the managing attorney of the Community Partnerships Program at Earth Justice. Earth Justice is the largest national nonprofit environmental law firm in the country with um, offices, um, 15 offices across the United States. I uh, work from our Los Angeles office. And I wanted to come down this morning for three reasons. First, how exciting is it to be in person and to see people in three dimensions? And to um, thank the board for your um, commitment to being in person. Um, and so I wanted to be here to stand with the board in the notion that where you are matters and that showing up is important and that sometimes even when it's hard, the extra effort is worth it. So thank you and thank you to all of your staff who allowed this meeting to occur today. The second thing I wanted to do was um, talk to you a little bit about 
some of the issues that uh, we are working on and to offer to you um, the opportunity to know a little bit about that and to encourage you to continue to focus attention on some of these critical issues. Right now, I want to raise your attention two things. First, the appeals process, which this board is working on so diligently, um, that has been a, the appeals process. I feel like it should be on like some kind of 30, a show. 30 seconds. Um, OK. The appeals process that um, this board is working on so diligently is so very important. And so I am, I am hopeful and looking forward to engaging deeply with this board as you develop an appeals process that's worthy of the community um, and folks who are trying to protect their health, safety, and quality of life. And I also want to encourage you to find out more about DTSC's implementation It's also complicated. No, <laughs> no, it's not on. It's not on. All right. Okay. All right. So I'll just finish my sentence. The second thing is the implementation of the 673 cumulative impacts process, which has two pieces to it, cumulative impacts in permitting and the violation scoring procedure. Both of these are critically important tools for ensuring that the agency is able to protect the health and safety and quality of life of frontline communities. And I urge this board to find out more information and add that to an item um, on the agenda in the near future. And I will um, not talk about my third thing. So thank you so much. I appreciate your time. And um, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that comment. And um, we definitely will follow up with you on that. And ex uh, we have a lot of onboarding. And that's, that's on the list. So thank you for being here. OK, thank you so much for that comment. So I will now check in with our um, our conference line to see if we have any English callers who would like to make a comment. Give me just one moment. Hi, Michelle. If you could allow the um, caller to uh, express their comment, please. Thank you. Colin Antonio, you may go ahead. Please get your affiliation. Sorry, hello, Alan Antonio? You may go ahead, sir. Okay, thanks so much. Uh, well, my name is Alan Antonio. I am uh, with the coalition called A Coalition for Healthy Families. And so I'm calling in right now to specifically talk about issues surrounding Atlas Metal Company and Children High School. May I move forward with another comment? Yes, please start your comment now. Okay, thank you. So the Healthy Family and Lake Coalition recently asked LA um, USD of superintendent and school board members for a meeting. Uh, specifically, the coalition was created to address issues happening in the Watts area as there's a lot of environmental justice going on, uh, specifically between Watts and Atlas Metal Company. Uh, the way they responded to us was by saying, and I quote, Los Angeles, Los Angeles Unified School District must be able to reply on responsive regulatory oversight and enforcement from uh, ju jur jurisdictions within the boundaries of a district to protect schools. The cities have robust uh, provisions within their municipal codes to update violations of law that are in public health and safety. The cities and other agencies have significant power to inspect, permit, and update threats and they use these powers frequently. The district must be able to fully rely on the appropriate agencies to do, to do that here and to protect the students and staff at Jordan High. So that's how they answer to us. And so what I've been forward today is that these other agencies, which LAUSD was talking about specifically, is DTSC. You know, it's really time for y'all to take action. It's really time for us to, you know, for there to be something for something to be done about it. And really, uh, DTSC is the agency, is that moving power 
that can bring justice to uh, to your and Hyatt and really just, you know, get things going around the issue of Atlas Metal Company. 30 because seconds. Far too long, these, these, you know, these students have suffered. Uh, there's just an increased exposure to lead levels. There are 75, 75% more ha- hazardous. Uh, and they also have flying metal sh- uh, sh- sharp notes, something shooting through the school, so there's really nothing dividing uh, the place, you know, which could cause injuries, cause stillbirth uh, in, in pregnant women, and so on. Um, so thank you for me being able to give public comment, and I urge you to something about it. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. I, um, I, I didn't catch every single word of it, so I'm going to ask that it be transcribed um, at the early side so that we can take it under consideration. But thank you for uh, expressing yourself, and we will attend to your comment. Thank you. Of course, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank and you. Uh, Michelle, we have a, you said we have a second commenter who would like to comment at this time? Yes, we do. Yvonne Watson, you may go ahead and please state your affiliation. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Hello? Okay. This is Yvonne Martinez-Watson. I am the chair of the Environmental and Social Justice Committee for the Angeles chapter of the Sierra Club. I'm commenting today to ask this board to, in the future, please schedule your meetings at a time when most residents, um, I'm also a resident of the city of Montebello, when most residents and interested parties will be able to attend the meeting instead of 10 o'clock in the morning. I'm asking for time, for a more, much more timely announcement to be made. I've already sent in a comment letter to the, um, to the board regarding this. And please be advised that there are a lot of people in these communities that are already being affected who will not be able to attend meetings in person. I, myself, am immunocompromised. And I did not find out about this meeting until the Friday when the announcement went out. And I had to scramble to get my email sent in to get an extension on the time for people to um, ask for special accommodations. Our communities have been suffering a lot with all these different types of environmental injustice. And uh, if you really want to increase public participation, you need to be aware that the public uh, is the one that needs to be accommodated. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comment. And I will, uh, I will note that our entire meeting dates, the dates for all of 22 and by the end of this meeting for all of 23 will be posted on the website. <clears throat> if you have any challenges accessing that, do email us and we'll send you the list of dates. We'll take into consideration the timing, part of which has to do with logistics, availability of venues and board members' um, timing since <clears throat> I think you know that each of the board members is uh, is here at half time, so they have other obligations and responsibilities as well. Uh, Swathi, the executive officer, and myself are full time, but the rest of the board are part time, and that makes scheduling the logistics for scheduling more complex, but we will definitely um, consider timing for future meetings. Thank you. And please, can you notify the mayor as well? <clears throat> notify, pardon? Can I didn't you no- notify the mayor of Montebello if you're holding meetings. I called the mayor and she was not aware of this meeting. The mayor of Montebello. I see. Okay. Um, I we guess will. if we come back here, we better be sure to do that. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your comment. So I am being notified by our um, operator that we do not have any callers um, wishing to make comment on our Spanish line at this time. So I did receive a comment card from Reverend Mac Shorty. If you would like to come to the podium and express your comment at this time. As the previous caller stated, and I saw one of the board members out in my community, we're here today to speak about Jordan High School. What people don't understand, the facilities, the recycling facilities around Jordan High School was long there before they built the school on top of contaminated soil. The soil was already contaminated. 
long before the recycling facility. And I'm, it's shameful, and I'm in prayer that this board, which represent us, really come out there and look at us. One member showed up. No community members was involved. LAUSD want to shove this down our throat, the community throat. We're living in a community where people can barely pay their power bill. So they recycle their aluminum cans and bottles. A power bill for two months in the Watts community is over $600. The city of Los Angeles made this big announcement about putting forward $1.3 billion to rebuild our community. They gave us apartment units, townhouse looking units with no solar power. But everything in the building is electric. The stove, the dryer, the washer, the microwave. These poor people cannot even afford to live there. And you talk about gentrification, this has to stop. If you get rid of the recycling facilities that provide good paying job, and I want to share this article that I put in the Capitol Weekly up in Sacramento. 30 seconds. I do this all the time. Go before boards that never looks like the communities that they're supposed to be helping. And it's shameful on the governor, the attorney general, LAUSD, who can't even graduate students that can fill out a one-page application. But to sit here and ask this board to go at the good paying jobs and places that we go and recycle our bottles at. Time. We can't go take them to LAUSD because most of the people work there don't even live in our community. But yet they want to talk about how they're helping our kids. How? How? If you want to help our kids, your job is to educate them. To help them proceed so that they can grow and move their families out of underserved community at some point in life. We're not dying. I've been living there 53 years. Reverend, your time is... I'm not dead. I'm still yet alive. I'm only going to go when Jesus called me. Not because some recycling facility that I go and sell my cans and bottles at. And I just want to share my article with the board members. There's enough for each and every one of you. There should have been more than one board member. LAUSD did not invite any community members, but yet they want to say that we're involved. We're not involved in the process. They're killing us with the process. Person by person, community by community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Uh, I appreciate that. We'll definitely get copies of the article for all board members. Uh, just part of my opening remarks is to address how we did the tours yesterday. And given the uh, legal boundaries that we operate under, we could not all go together to any one location. So two of us went to one, two of us, and uh, I think... Alexis, you were you were on that tour. It marks the beginning of us doing this, not the end. So I just want to look you right in the eye and say it's the first of many. And we spread out and did the best we could over yesterday to get our feet on the ground. So um, I appreciate your comment, and I just wanted to explain that piece uh, so that you could understand that it's what we had to do um, in order to be compliant, but thank you. <clears throat> so I alluded to it just now, but today marks the first opportunity for the Board of Environmental Sa Safety, the DTSC leadership, the director, the deputy director, and staff our executive officer, board members, to be hosted by community organizations and in touring sites and meeting with community members. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Um, excuse me. I know I'm not supposed to do this. Don't anybody tell anybody. <laughs> <clears throat> no, there's no uh, no beverages allowed at the board at the uh, dais. So. So as I said, there were three tours yesterday and meetings with community members, and we divided up and went to different sites, and the organizations that invited us um, were uh, invited other members of their communities to join one of the three tours. So to the extent that we were successful, we want to hear about it, and to the extent, as this gentleman suggested, that it was not as robust, we want to hear about that as well. So thank you. We'll hear, we wanted to hear the concerns and recommendations, which we did all day yesterday. Uh, and 
I, for example, was on a tour that was led by Change, CBE, and PSR LA, uh, and other partner organizations from the local area. You'll hear from board members and community members today about those site visits and discussions. The goals of our tour were best expressed by the organizations that organized them, and it was to build cross-learning opportunities establish the common ground and alignment that we have on gaps, barriers, challenges, and opportunities. We wanted to amplify environmental justice and indigenous-centered solutions to provide spaces for impacted residents to speak to us directly about their experience. So we are here to listen and to incorporate into our thinking and actions the concerns voiced and to ensure that our work reflects that understanding and that commitment. You'll hear much more as the day goes on. Your participation, and for many of you, the scores of years and endless meetings and commentaries will help ensure that the reform efforts that, DTA, that have been undertaken with the establishment of this board, the legislation, remembering that this board came together in March of this year. So we're five months into our tenure. There were, legis there were mandates by the legislation, funding uh, in, in SB 158, and our goal and the goal of the governor, Cal EPA, and DTSC is to correct the historical wrongs, to provide a promise for a healthier Californian, California for all of our citizens. The board is here because of all of your efforts, your demands, your concerns, your complaints saying, this agency, this department needed more resources, more access, more engagement, and it has been welcomed by uh, the team at DTSC. So our agenda today includes hearing from board and attendees regarding our three distinct visits yesterday, July 11th, on the Toxics and Solution Tours. We expect that this will take up a good part of the day today. We will also hear from the director of DTSC, Meredith Williams, who joined us yesterday, along with Deputy Director Francesca Negri. We will hear from her as well, her experience on being on the bus and touring the community sites. There are some agenda sequence changes, and you can jot them down or just follow along with us. Agenda item nine, which is the Exide update, will be moved to this morning. We are most fortunate to have with us today Mike Montgomery from Region 9 EPA, who will report out on the July 1 announcement regarding the DTSC Cal EPA administration request that EPA designate, designate EPA as a Superfund site. So, Mike, I'm glad you're here. Thank you. We'll call you up early in the agenda. Thank you. We'll have an update from our executive officer, Swathi Sharma, who has hit the road running since coming on board in May, May 18th. In addition to overseeing the contract for future meeting services with CSUS, EO Sharma will present the contract for future translation services. For all those of you who, attend, who have attended previous meetings, you know that we have established priority priority areas for each board member to focus their attentions and we'll report out to you today. We will hear from each member and the EO as to the work they're doing to advance their efforts for environmental justice and strategic planning, permit appeals process, which was noted by uh, one of the speakers today, liaisons with boards, departments, and organizations, and all of the activities that, that we're engaged with to be in the community, with community members, with um, the regulated communities. So we will talk about what we've been doing with that. Just as with each prior priority area, we've established a second person to work with the lead to ensure collaboration and redundancy. And so too have we identified the need for the role of a vice chair as an essential one. And later on in the agenda, um, I will be addressing that nomination, looking again at the skills and interests of individual board members, what they bring to the table, and where they can best serve the board and the community. We'll review the meeting calendar together, as noted um, uh, to the caller who wasn't clear about all of our meeting dates. We'll go over them again for 2022 and also uh, take, 
take a vote on approving the dates for 2023 so that all of you have plenty of time to prepare for our meetings. Going forward, we will incorporate standing items to our agenda, including the mandated areas of work and also priority areas for each board member so that it's really clear in advance the areas that we intend to cover. Should issues arise today that we want to put on a future agenda, we'll identify identify those as we go along and during public comment. So if there are issues that you feel this board ought to address as an agenda item in the future, we ask you to make note of that. On August 25th, the meeting will be held in the Sacramento area and focus primarily on presentations in a workshop format from the permit team of DTSC and discussion of proposed process for the Board of Environmental Safety's assumption of the role of hearing future permit appeals. So that's an important meeting for those of you who have been attending to the issue of the process of permit appeals. So we want to be able to commence hearing permits in 2023. We reported at previous meetings that an appeal was filed regarding a permit modification approval issued to Cometco and challenged by Earth Justice on behalf, <clears throat> excuse me, of the Clean Air Co Coalition of North, North Whittier and Avocado Heights. That permit modification request was withdrawn by Cometco last week rendering the appeal process for us moot. We continue to monitor for appeals and we'll address them when they come in. So meetings and conferences, I'll just let you know that we've been, in addition to community member meetings, we've also been out there networking and connecting with people. I personally presented to the Chemical Industry Council of California, along with the Director Williams and Deputy Director Negri, um, and we'll participate in a webinar with the California Council of Environmental and Economic Balance. Those of you call it SEEB. Alexis Hacker will represent the Board of Environmental Safety at a SEEB annual meeting in August. So we're responding to invitations um, as uh, aggressively as we can. I will appear before the legislature on August 3rd to report out on the board's progress in the five months since our inception. So I hope you will all sign up to get our, our email alerts. Uh, one of our, our goals and we're, is how, what our communication strategies are going forward. How do we reach out? How do we keep you all informed? So for now, the best you can do is sign up for our email and uh, we will alert you to meetings and any other activities that uh, going forward. So thank you, Jessica. Um, would you like to move into agenda item eight at this time? Would I like to move into agenda item eight? Yes, I would. Um, so again, or we talked I, about changes to the... I apologize, number seven. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, I think with your mask, Jessica, I am having a little... Seven. Okay. Okay. We're back on track. Agenda item seven. I am really uh, delighted to uh, introduce uh, the Director of the Department of Toxic Substances Control, Meredith Williams, and she will provide um, her report now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Rizzo. Thank you, board members, for being here. And thank you for all of you who um, made time to attend here in person or join us by phone. We do realize this is in the middle of the workday and is challenging. Um, so it's good to see so many people who were able to accommodate the schedule and be here in person. Um, in person is going to be a theme for the day, I suspect. It certainly is a theme for me um, in that uh, over the past several weeks, I have been out and about and uh, more than I have been through the entire pandemic. So I've had a lot of opportunity for in-person in meetings and it's of course quite an adjustment after such a long time working virtually, um, but it's been a remarkable stretch of, of opportunities to be out and, and interact with fellow agencies and with community members and really dig into our issues. So I wanted to just focus on some of that activity today in my, in my comments as a, as a way of providing an update to the board. Uh, 
first and foremost, I've had a number of opportunities to work with our partners at US EPA Region 9 um, uh, around a range of issues and, and through in-person meetings. So the first being that we met with um, the Department of Public Health, um, the US EPA, uh, Water Board staff, and the Navy to talk about the Hunters Point Naval Shipyard cleanup. As you are, many of you are well aware, that is a cleanup that has been, has long frustrated uh, communities, a community in, in San Francisco, largely and, and most notably because uh, the contractor who was hired to do some of that work falsified data. And in, in fact, went to um, was imprisoned for having done so. Two of the contractors, and that really has made, justifiably made the community very mistrustful of the work that's being done to clean up that facility. So it's heartening to see the agencies come together work in close coordination in an effort to hold the Navy accountable to their cleanup requirements and to expedite the cleanup. So it's it's a, a remarkable meeting in terms of the level of leadership that participates in that meeting and the focus on, um, on, on actions and getting the work done and moving that forward. And again, I don't think that happens quite in the same way when it's done remotely as it is in person. Uh, Chief Deputy Director Negri and I, among others, were able to um, go out to Jackson, uh, California. Some of you may have heard Jackson in the news lately because there is a wildfire burning there. But we were there to tour a cleanup site that's now a super fun cleanup site, again with our Region 9, EPA Region 9 partners. Um, called the Argonaut Mines. And DTSC play, played a pivotal role in uh, one element of that cleanup in that um, that is a former mine site and there were mine tailings perched above uh, the city behind a dam, a very old dam. And that dam a number of years ago was at risk of failure. And it became a very emergent uh, situation in, in terms of realizing just how, how vulnerable that town was to a failure in that dam. And should that dam have failed, the, the mine tailings, very highly contaminated mine tailings would have had a direct path to move down into the city. And so US EPA and DTSC worked closely to design and and engineer and put in place a mine that now stands there, it's robust, and it will keep those mine tailings safely in place um, as the rest of the cleanup goes on. It's a very complicated cleanup, but one of the highlights of that trip was not just seeing the mine and, and getting a, a better sense of the, I'd been out to the mine before, but had never really grasped the, the magnitude of that cleanup. But the, we were fortunate enough to be joined by the mayor and the city manager and as we looked out over the town they pointed to a hill across the way and said just so you know we just received some funding from DTSC from the one-time funding that DT the 500 million dollars one-time funding that DTSC received in its cleanup and <coughs> vulnerable communities initiative um, and we're going to use that money to clean up that site and pre provide recreational space for our community that uh, project came through our equitable uh, communities revitalization grants program and we are just we're so excited about that program so i'll uh, just to say a little bit more about that um, we uh, awarded those grants just um, just a few weeks ago to the two we still we have 200 um, 250 million dollars to award over the the whole cycle of the grants program, but we awarded our first set, which was $75 million. There were 52 recipients of those uh, grants, and that results in 25 cleanup projects, 21 investigations, and seven community-wide assessments, which allow communities uh, to, to look at all of the brownfields in their communities and determine where their most important opportunities are for cleanup in the future. Um, we're very excited to be to to see that in real you know in real time um, where that where that's happening for a, a particular community. 
Um, another re Region 9 partnership I'll talk about is the, in a minute, is the um, partnership on the potential national priorities list, super fund listing um, with Region 9. Uh, another trip I was able to make was to attend the California Land Recycling Conference. It's a Brownfields Recycling Conference. It is yet another partnership with EPA, as well as the Center for Creative Land Recycling. Um, I was fortunate enough to be able to give the keynote talk there, and my keynote was largely informed by conversations we had been having with a number of stakeholders who were concerned about the Equitable Communities Revitalization Grant Program, the ECRG, who really talked about the nexus between housing and cleanups and redlining and displacement. And so it gave me an opportunity to really look at that issue more closely, to dig into it a bit more, and in fact uh, challenge the attendees to do the same thing. Really understand that this is a, continu a continuum. Uh, it's, a, it's a straight thread from redlining practices to communities living very close to toxic sites or having toxic facilities uh, located where they live and um, and obviously has tremendous implications if we're talking about housing and, and so we need to be in conversation and, and actually take some action to think about to make sure that as if housing is going to be developed in these communities on those former industrial sites that it's done in a way that doesn't perpetuate some of the problems and the legacies. It was uh, uh, I was so glad to be at that conference in person, but again, it gave me the opportunity to meet about a dozen of our ECRG grant recipients and really hear them tell their stories uh, about what their what their plans are, what they what their visions are for doing things with these funds. So we heard stories about people who will be. Um, putting grocery stores in neighborhoods that are food deserts, or providing services to the unhoused, um, or doing either affordable and yes, market rate development, or creating tribal ceremonial lands. So it was quite a breadth, um, and, and hearing a few of those stories, you know, in terms of people who have had sites in their communities for decades that they've been unable to address. And this funding finally was the thing they needed to, you know, get that that contaminated uh, elementary school remediated so that they could put a community center on it. That kind of story. So really remarkable. And of course, as you mentioned yesterday, we had a chance to hear quite a number of stories as we toured um, toured neighbors, neighborhoods in South and Southeast LA. And I first and foremost want to thank the board for initiating and reaching out to community groups to ask for this kind of tour and taking advantage of their generosity and willingness to, to um, host such a tour. Uh, I was really pleased that our chief counsel, Larry Hafis, was able to join our director for our Office of Environmental Equity, Ivana Casares, was, was on one of the tours, and um, uh, chief deputy director, Francesca Negri was there, and Diana Ballesteros, who is our director for our legislative office. So uh, uh, again, very pleased that we were able to get folks out to really hear directly rather than have things um, either be two-dimensional or get lost in translation. It was a remarkable day. I think I want to especially thank uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility and Communities for a Better Environment for all the organizing they did around that. But really, I want to thank um, all of the organizations who participated and the and the individuals who spoke about their experiences, who spoke about you know their frustrations um, with how a city council uh, allowed uh, permitted a, a school site without going through the, uh, proper environmental um, review, and those are, those are very informative. Uh, and there were a couple themes that arose throughout the conversation over the days. Um, first of all, I just want to comment the breadth of the problem. It, there were three separate tours yesterday, three tours, and that means there were three tours worth of issues, three tours worth of sites, three tours worth of frustrations that um, 
that we heard about yesterday. And that's just DTSC issues. Throughout the day, we heard a lot about the intersectionality of this work with everything from a just transition um, to, you know, more environmentally friendly employment, um, to schools and education, to a lot of different issues. And I know Chief Deputy Director uh, Negri and her comments will talk a little bit about the intersectionality and what we, what we think we can do to keep that front and center in our minds and take some actions to, um, to start to work in a way that really uh, incorporates that, that tremendous learning from yesterday. Um, I would say that for us, the, the other thing is, and again, uh, the tongue was set very early in the day of, um, where we were challenged about how DTSC often makes decisions. And I will say the, 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 uh, it was decide, announce, and defend was used as the descriptor for how DTSC often makes its decisions. And um, that really, obviously, it stuck. <laughs> it, it stuck and it will stick. And so um, if we've decided, then is there is there still an opportunity for, for meaningful community engagement or is it too late? Um, how do we move that process earlier? Um, how do we really truly have informed participation and um, and be in listening mode. And I often use the phrase beginner's mind. Um, and we need to have beginner's mind in terms of not presuming that we know what communities want, what they need, and how best to move forward. So it was, it was very sobering on that f front. And again, there's no real substitute for in-person meetings to get an, a sense of the importance of the work. Um, and so with that, I, I want to offer uh, Chief Deputy Director Negri the chance to make a few comments, and then I'll come up and uh, come back and wrap up with a few more um, items. Good morning, um, Chair Rizzo and board members. Thank you so much for having us here today. It's been a pleasure and a privilege to spend the past couple of days with you. And um, for you members of the community, with some of you yesterday was... Um, uh, such a such an opportunity and, and so compelling. I want to express um, echo Director Williams in expressing my gratitude to Change CB, CBE PSR and many many other organizations and community members who um, put time and effort into planning yesterday's tours and to sharing with us. Um, their shared experiences, their lived experiences, sharing with us details about their vibrant communities, the culture uh, that they feel so passionate about protecting, um, and their passion for equity and the desire to collaborate with DTSC and the board to develop solutions that provide meaningful, uh, predictable, and frequent access um, so that the decisions that we make are include those voices and are collaborating with our communities. Um, I really appreciate um, the individual and unique community uh, member stories that were shared with us. Um, they hit home for us. It's, um, you know, it's been a few years since we've been able to get out and meet face to face with people. And uh, notwithstanding sometimes that the virtual environment can uh, increase inclusivity, it certainly does not replace the value of the face-to-face -face discussions when we can sit to get down together at a table and eat um, together and um, have the opportunity to listen to um, community member experiences. And um, Meredith and I... Um, really value those opportunities and welcome um, more of those in the near future. I think some key takeaways for me, um, building on Meredith's or taking on, on Meredith's um, reference to intersectionality is that these, these issues are very complicated. They're long standing, they've taken a long time to develop, and it's going to take a lot of hard work 
um, to solve these problems. And community members have rightly and justifiably expressed their frustration when DTSC says, that's not within our purview, that's not within our authority, that's some other agency, that's some other department, and doesn't take a proactive and leadership role in bringing um, the, right, the, the right entities to the table to problem solve. I'm very optimistic and heartened by um, the recent collaboration with Region 9. It's been a great experience for us. Uh, it gives me hope for the future, but there's a lot more work to do. And so we heard yesterday um, issues that cross um, boards, departments, and offices within, within the Cal EPA umbrella. We heard issues that include, you know, should include local government and representatives. We heard issues that, well, we should be doing a better job collaborating with our federal partners. Um, so, Many of the community organizations that participated yesterday and provided um, some presentation to, presentations to us had some specific asks. And while we understand that those asks aren't representative of all that needs to be done, they provide a blueprint for the path forward. And I um, am looking forward to working with Swathi, uh, the executive officer, to operationalize that blueprint to provide, and of course, our Assistant Director of Office of Environmental Equity, to develop a path forward that's more predictable, more um, inclusive, and um, provides better access to all of the entities that need to be collaborating and present in the solution of these complex problems. So with that, I'll hand it back to Director Williams. Thank you so much again for being here. I know it's um, time out of your busy days um, to be here, and I, I thank uh, all of the callers for calling in today, and I look forward to more collaboration in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Francesca. So there are a few other things that I wanted to highlight in addition to the tour. We could obviously, and we will get a chance to hear more about the tour throughout the, the day today. But um, uh, there are a couple other major announcements within the department or major goings on that I wanted to mention. First of all, as many of you may know, um, DTSC reached a settlement agreement with Boeing Corporation for their cleanup responsibilities at the Santa Susana Field Laboratory. Um, that That is a... a, a 2,800-acre site at the top of Simi Valley. It's kind of between San, San Fernando Valley and Simi Valley. Um, highly contaminated based on nuclear research that was done there, rocket testing. Um, and it's a site that's uh, the responsible parties for that cleanup are NASA, the Department of Energy, and Boeing. And for years, Boeing had positioned that they had uh, very limited responsibilities in terms of their cleanup and, in fact, would only clean up uh, to the extent that would be, that would allow somebody to, for instance, use the space recreationally, um, which would be, you know, uh, walking their dog for several hours a day, uh, a couple times a week, or something along those lines, as opposed to a really, truly highly protective cleanup that would allow someone to live on that land, to uh, even plant a garden and eat the vegetables out of that garden. We call that a resident with garden cleanup standard. And so although we have not set the cleanup standard for Boeing's um, cleanup because we haven't finished the um, California Environmental Quality Act requirements for reaching decision, um, we have reached agreement with Boeing that should we choose that very high cleanup standard of resident with garden, they will no longer, they, they, uh, litigation is off the table. And this is a very significant change in their posture where um, we are pleased with, with the outcome. We believe that this is creates a path to a cleanup with some certainty that once we finish the CEQA process, we can get this cleanup moving in earnest with all three responsible parties and uh, move it forward. It's going to take a long time to clean that, that site. It's, it's, the access is very challenging. It's up at the top of very windy roads. Um, the contamination is profound in terms of the number of contaminants 
evidence and the extent of the contamination. And so to reach this agreement, we think, is um, really is puts us on the path to the most important thing. And the most important thing is getting it cleaned up. It's not litigating. And so um, we're very pleased to have made that announcement. Um, the, the agreement will not become final until the Water Board discusses a, a partner memorandum of understanding. They'll do that in, uh, in August. Um, and should that agreement um, get finalized, then our agreement will go into effect and we'll just roll up our sleeves and get to work and move that cleanup forward. Um, the other announcement I want to make is something that's coming up, um, which is that on July 27th, um, the Safer Consumer Products Program will host a nail salons workshop. Um, the, this is an area that uh, the Safer Consumer Products Program has been giving attention for a number of years. We know that there are a lot of toxic chemicals contained as well. <laughs> Some of the, the board members have very intimate uh, experience with this, but um, a lot of toxic chemicals in nail salon products. And when um, women of color of childbearing age are exposed to those chemicals in poorly ventilated small studios without personal protective equipment, we're, we're leaving workers at significant risk. And so we've put a lot of energy, that program is, has focused, they're very scientifically rigorous, so they've done a number of things. We've, they went out and purchased about 100 products and did the lab analysis to figure out exactly what was in those products. We did a data call in. We asked manufacturers what chemicals are you using in your products, why are you using them in your products, and and you know, how do we move that forward? And then we did our own research, um, just, you know, uh, reading the academic literature and reading exposure studies, et, et cetera. And in bringing all of those things together, which will be shared on July 27th, it gives us the opportunity to really prioritize what steps we take next. We've already um, proposed toluene um, in nail salon products as a priority product, meaning that manufacturers would have to look for safer alternatives. And we're excited to see this move forward. It really. It's, you know, one of the stops we had yesterday on the tour was to a, a, a salon. Uh, and uh, the salon owner is really eager to use, and this is a hair salon for most primarily for African American women who want to use natural hair and natural hair products. And he talked about the struggle to find safer products. And that's one reason why so many African American and, and um, uh, communities of color, the salons in those communities, they develop their own products. There's, they're very enterprising. And the part of the reason they do that is they want to know what's in the products. They want to have that certainty. And so, so to the extent that it's possible, safer consumer products can drive market change, can drive more transparency around what's in product formulations. And this is a, a good example of focusing on a vulnerable community and, um, and making room for them to um, to be able to buy safer products. So those are just a few of the things going on in the department, but I will wrap up by circling back to our partnership with US EPA. Uh, as you mentioned, Jeannie, there was a request we put in through the administration uh, on July 1st that Exide be listed on the Superfund list for uh, at the federal level. The state has invested a tremendous amount of money, $700 million approximately, um, in cleaning up the Exide facility and the properties surrounding Exide that were contaminated by Exide's, um, Exide's operations. The expectation had been that Exide would, uh, we would be able to re reimburse the state and the taxpayers for that money um, through Exide, cost recovering from Exide. But Exide, of course, declared bankruptcy and through that bankruptcy was able to evade their obligations. And that leaves, of course, California on the hook to pay for the cleanup. Despite this remarkable investment, it's been, a, as I said, a tremendous investment that's had had clear payoffs. For instance, we've cleaned up nearly 4,000 properties surrounding Exide at this point. Um, we, 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 over the past few months, we've, I, we're very close to averaging 100 properties a month in our cleanup. I know one month was 96 and one, one was slightly above 100. So we're cleaning up at a, um, at a rate that frustrates the community, but we know it's, it's uh, a rate that's, uh, 
it's what's achievable um, and manageable. Um, so that's been happening surrounding the facility. The Vernon Environmental Response Trust that was put in place after the bankruptcy has exhausted all of the funds that were available to it. Um, we have left them with enough funds to oversee that that site, pay the property taxes, and oversee the sale of the site with DTSC's approval when it's cleaned up and when the time comes. And that means that, you know, we're back to using taxpayer money money to do the work. So they, they, we still have $244 million left, um, and we will not stop our cleanup. We'll continue things on, but um, we have not addressed any needed, other than some very high levels, some early actions. Um, the industrial areas surrounding the facility have not been remediated and we don't have funding to do that really. Um, and, um, you know, US EPA will go through its own process to assess what they think needs to be done and perhaps close some gaps in terms of remediation. Um, but uh, we think that, uh, we need to bring all the resources available to bear to make sure that the, the cleanup is comprehensive and complete. We will not stop our work. We will be there. We will continue. We will partnership and make sure there's continuity with anything that US EPA does. We've already started that partnership. We've shared data with uh, US EPA. Um, and um, you know, one of the things you do when you request Superfund listing is fill out the checklist to get the, the process started. And they have that checklist in hand and have the information to um, get the process started. So um, I'm really pleased to, that Mike Montgomery, who is the director of US EPA Region 9 Superfund and Emergency Management Division, was able to join us today. That was no small feat in and of itself. And um, Mark, Mike is going to explain a little bit about the partnership and what the process will look like as, um, as they go through the Superfund listing process. So... With that, I'll turn it over to Mike. Thank you. So actually, really quickly, I wanted to make an announcement for um, all of us who, all of those who joined us um, today that may not have heard some of our earlier announcements. Okay. Yeah. What, what's the announcement? Um, silencing cell phones, no food and drinks in the chambers, um, and no signs as well, and then also some other things for communication purposes. What Can do I? you need to say? Sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little bit weird turning around to look at you. Okay. Um, thank you all so much for joining us and taking times out of your out of your busy lives to join us. Um, we just want to talk about the rules of the chamber office while you're here and discuss a little bit about how um, you can comment. So when there are opportunities to comment, you can come up to the microphone and make that comment. Um, and you will have two minutes to comment, to, um, which could change at the discretion of the board. Um, you will need to speak directly into that microphone and also to our board members and anyone presenting today, please speak directly into the microphone so that those folks joining us at home on the webcast are able to uh, fully participate as well. Also, one last thing. Um, this meeting is being recorded by your continued participation. That is agreement that you are being recorded and agree and agree to the recording. Um, I think that's it. Okay, Jet. Uh, no questions or comments on that. We'll have um, a public comment period after we hear from. Uh, Mike Montgomery, and people can comment on the presentations by um, Director Williams and Deputy Director Negri, as well as um, Mike. Welcome. This is a great way to meet. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I applaud the in-person meeting. And uh, yeah, I just want to start by by thanking the chair, chair Rizzo and the board for the opportunity to come and speak today. I think it's uh, pretty visionary that that the state of California has created this board, and they've been fortunate to get very high quality people on it. And uh, with the additional funding that's been provided, I'm really optimistic about DTSC's future. 
Also want to thank Director Williams in the effort in the run up to the announcement in July. I think we've we've been very well coordinated and um, I'm looking forward to, to what lies ahead. You know, e e EPA and the state have had a long relationship with Exide under the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, um, working together to, to get a lot of good work done. But July 1st uh, marks a new, uh, a new phase and a critical phase in the project. And I'm not gonna talk too much about the site itself and the surrounding community today. I'm gonna talk mostly about the Superfund listing process, but I think it goes almost goes without saying and was clearly in the um, regional administrator Guzman's press uh, release that uh, the, the community surrounding Exide is a, is a community that has significant environmental justice concerns. It's, it's, a, it's an overburdened community to say the least and lead is a contamination, uh, is a well-known contaminant and it's, it's the harm that can cause in humans is, is significant and it's taken very seriously by EPA and uh, is actually a significant priority for this administration under the lead strategy that's been put forward. So with that, I'm gonna give a little bit of background about who we are, what we do, what the NPL is, and, um, and how sites get listed. So um, I'll go to the next slide, please. So US EPA Region 9 covers a, a, a big part of the Southwest and a, and a big part of the Outer Pacific. Uh, we have 148 Native American tribes within the region and uh, are about 800 employees. We are primary offices in San Francisco, but we also have a, a office here in Los Angeles, uh, one in San Diego, one in Honolulu, and then we have our lab in Corvallis, and we have... Um, some emergency response warehouses, including one here in Signal Hill and Long Beach. Uh, we have first responders uh, that respond to incidences of national emergencies. Uh, we have a number of project managers, toxicologists, hydrologists, engineers, and um, of course, uh, contracting resources and uh, provide a significant amount of funding to our states to do a lot of work. Uh, next slide, please. So the Superfund program uh, in 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 Region Nine, uh, we we have a number of active sites throughout the area. The picture here is of a a site that was the largest DDT manufacturer in the world. It was located down in uh, in near Torrance, um, and we've been working on that site for a long time. We have a significant number of federal properties that we're cleaning up with uh, the Department of Defense and with the Department of Energy. And then, of course, we have a lot of groundwater contamination here uh, in the LA area, as well as in Arizona, the San Gabriel Valley, San Fernando Valley. Uh, we have work going on in the Inland Empire and the North North Orange County Basin. So we we do a lot of work to make sure that uh, groundwater contamination uh, doesn't impact communities, and and we assure the safe supply of a significant amount of water to those communities. Uh, next slide, please. So what does it mean to uh, to go on the NPL, uh, the National Priorities List of Superfund Sites? The Superfund program uh, was created to identify um, releases of hazardous substances that pose a significant threat to the community. But, um, you know, we, we were given it, uh, significant enforcement authority. We have the ability to go after private parties that cause or create that contamination. But we also have access to funds where those parties uh, are, are can't be identified or don't have the resources to do the cleanup work. And um, that's uh, gonna, I think, part, part of the significance here is that we are gonna bring both our enforcement authority as well as uh, hopefully future funding authority um, that would be available to us. And, um, you know, in the recent past, it could take years to get funding to do cleanup work, but uh, but that recently changed significantly with the bipartisan infrastructure law. Uh, the funding that was provided that was provided under the bipartisan um, infrastructure bill uh, addressed a backlog of uh, funding needs for cleanups across the country, and it also reestablished a tax on feedstock chem chemicals that makes continuing funding of our program um, 
more robust and realistic for a number of years, that tax had lapsed. And so the certainty of ongoing appropriations um, was less uh, was was less so, was less certain. So uh, there, there's definitely been a shift in the program. And uh, the way a site or a, a source of contamination starts down that process is by getting put through a, a scoring process that looks at uh, available data to determine whether or not uh, there's been a release that is significant enough for us to consider putting it onto the national priorities list. And I'll, I'll talk about that process a little bit later. One important thing to understand in the context of Excite is that um, uh, this site is, m many sites that come to us to be scored and put on the national priorities list are sites where um, there hasn't been significant cleanup to date. There hasn't been significant site characterization work done to date. And this site obviously comes into the system with um, a lot more information readily available than we would normally have. And that's a good thing because it will hopefully make our process uh, go more smoothly. But it's not a risk assessment. And so uh, it's important for uh, communities to understand that this is a very uh, uh, high level review of existing information to determine whether or not the release is significant for us to consider putting it on the NPL. Um, and so I'll, 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 let's go to the next slide because I can get into that a little bit more. What, what the HRS is. So it's, it's really just a, it's a mathematical model and it's not particularly complicated. It looks at various pathways that contaminants can go through to cause harm to humans or the environment. And so what we're looking for when we do this mathematical calculation is the types of pollutants that are um, in these various media, in the groundwater, in lakes and streams, in soil, in yards, or in soil, in industrial properties, and then what may be uh, going into the air where people can breathe. Uh, we'll look at whatever data is available from the site for contaminants that are in those various media, looking at the amount of contamination, the severity of it, and looking at the size of the population that's exposed. And uh, we'll um, basically compile all of that and do a numerical calculation. And if that numerical calculation is above 28.5, then the site is eligible for us to then uh, put it on, put put it out for public comment to put it onto the national priorities list. And that's when, um, at that point, that significant additional funds are available to do cleanup. I'll talk a little bit later. There is some funding that we can provide in advance of that formal listing, which I think we're we're, we're planning on, on, on doing and working towards. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, as Director Williams mentioned, uh, the, there's a, a, a little tiny box on the top left to the left of this first box of determining whether a site meets the listing criteria, which is a pre-circular screening uh, document, which the state provided to us when they submitted the request to consider NPL listing. And that uh, is under review, and I think we're very close to completing that review, and we should ha have an answer in the next um, in the next week or so. So that's we, we put our attention to that uh, pretty quickly. Uh, we're just uh, obviously just 10 days into this process. but um, and, and then once we do that, then we'll be getting all the information, all the additional information uh, beyond what's in that initial checklist from the state and attempting to perform uh, something called a preliminary assessment. So we have the resources set aside to do that. And that will be uh, what will help us develop the the scoring that I mentioned before. And then we send that package on to our headquarters for approval. And once that's approved, um, we're, we, we, we're asked to get the state's concurrence. In this case, that process will be much, uh, obviously very shortened because the states asked us to list it. And that's not always the case in some states. We may be looking to list sites where, uh, it's uncertain as to whether or not the state approves the listing. Not the case here. So that'll be a shortened process. And then um, we have to put it out through the Federal Register for a public comment period of 60 days. Um, we typically do that 
uh, federal register notification twice a year in the spring and in the fall. In some instances, we'll do um, an independent uh, notification, but usually we can cycle it into that into that system. And it's at that point that we can um, start ac- start accessing some of the funds we have, not the funds for cleanup, but the other funds to do investigative work. Um, and uh, so we don't necessarily have to wait until the final um, listing, uh, but we, we will respond to public comment. Uh, we'll work with the state to create a forum to have dialogue with the community. Um, I really applaud the state's efforts to work with the community here. And um, we will work very closely with the state to build on the bridges that have been created and the relationships that have been established. Uh, and then we'll go to final listing. And the site um, would then be placed onto the national priorities list. So that's essentially our process. Um, you know, I, re- I want to take a minute, you know, in, in closing here to really co- commend the state for uh, the work that they've done to do residential cleanup at over 4,000 properties. That's not easy work. Um, I've been involved with a large number of residential cleanups in different communities throughout the Southwest, and it's um, it's very difficult to do, and uh, achievement on that scale is is really significant. I also want to applaud the state for having dedicated significant amount of funds towards breaking that exposure pathway. And I know there's a lot of work left to do, um, and uh, and so uh, I don't I don't want to ignore that, but I do want to recognize the significant effort that's that's happened to date. Um, you know, in addition to this more you know detailed process of putting the site on the national priorities list. We're uh, continuing to have a high-level dialogue with myself and director. We're going to have a retreat in August to work, focus on knowledge transfer and how to streamline uh, work uh, as we go forward. Uh, there, there are significant opportunities under our regulation for the state to be the lead on project activities at a site. So just because a site's on the NPL doesn't necessarily mean that EPA is the lead agency, um, and we'll be talking about opportunities to consider those options as we go forward. And uh, and I'm excited to say I'm going to be returning next week to uh, to visit uh, the facility and the surrounding communities. We have an effort underway to sample yards nearby the Central Metal site. It's one of our lead pilot programs, and so uh, some of the same community. Uh, groups are involved, so I'll be excited to get back down here next week and see, and 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 see the work uh, firsthand. And um, with that, I'm, I'm I'm finished. I'm happy to answer any questions. And uh, again, really want to thank the board for their time today. Well, thank you, Mike. Uh, this was a, a big announcement, a big achievement, and your readiness to work. I I, I made note of a couple of things. One, the forum the forum for um, public comment, uh, working with DTSC, and I hope with all of us to participate in that forum. And <clears throat> as you meet with community groups locally, um, Lizette Ruiz is um, local to us and also part of CBE, and I'm sure she'll enjoy being invited to that and representing us. Um, <clears throat> and I apologize for the dry throat today. Uh, so. Can we commit to that? Yes. <laughs> okay. I thought so. Uh, we have an opportunity now for public comment or questions that people have to the extent um, that you have comments or uh, about any of the presentations from um, Dr. Williams or Francesca and also questions for Mike. Now would be the time for you to uh, come forward. Thank you. Okay, thank you all again. So we, I will be helping to facilitate facilitate this public comment period. So um, if you have joined us in person, please complete a comment card for each agenda item that you would like to comment on and return it to one of the DTSC staff. Uh, if you have joined us by phone, please press one to join the queue during the agenda item that you would like to provide your comment on. And please provide your name and affiliation at the at the prompt. Um, so you can press star two to withdraw your comment. 
Um, and if you would like to ex express your comment in writing only, please uh, email besinfo at bes.dtsc.ca.gov. So the webcast is only being broadcast in English at this time. So if you would like to, if you are joining us remotely and would like to hear and participate in this meeting in Spanish, um, please call the number on your screen and I will have one of our interpreters come on to the, um, onto the English line um, in case anybody needs to needs the phone number to switch over. So um, Brittany or Sergio, if one of you would, thank you. Brittany, they can't hear you over the. Thank you so much, Brittany. Um, so at this time, each commenter will be given two minutes. We will uh, let you know when there are 30 seconds remaining and when time expires. Um, so um, the time allotted will be doubled for participants who wish to express their comment in Spanish, and that will allow our interpreters to do consecutive interpretation. So any of our, um, anyone who wishes to express a comment in Spanish, please pause after every couple of sentences to allow our interpreters to then interpret for you um, so that we can all gather what your comment is. So the way that comments will work is uh, we will go with the comment cards that I have received for this agenda item already. Uh, we will then go to our call-in lines, and then we will go to raised hands in the room. Um, so at this time, I do have a comment from Pete Reyes. Um, if you would like to come up to the microphone. <coughs> Uh, before my time uh, uh, starts, I just want to say thank you for creating the space. Um, but I do ask that, <clears throat> like, who are we really talking to? There's 4,000 homes, 1.7 mile radius, and the people here are, I would say 10, 15 people from here, we brought them, and the rest are staff. My point is, it would be nice if we can create the space, since we're talking about inclusivity, when people can work. Uh, I had to miss work today. Unfortunately, most of the people that represent the community can miss work and they work day to day. I'm pretty sure DTSC and you guys have the privilege to change the time and work with the, with the community schedule. Because if we are gonna be inclusive, let's try to have a community here. Because there's no way that we have 4,000 homes, 1.7 mile radius, and we only have 10 people here. Um, so with that said, <clears throat> also I wanted to turn in these photos if that's possible. I know there's no posters allowed, but I want the committee to see pictures that I've experienced, witnessed, and been with the community. Um, so if I can turn those in, or I can just show them to you here, however you want to do it. I think if you can show them to us, I'm okay. we're eager to see them. I know we can't put them up, but um, sure. sure. Um, are so these for the, a demonstration, or are you providing them? I can provide them as well. This show, Unsanitary Workplace, um, inequality stuff that happens at the work. Um, we have generations of... Yeah, if you hold them up and then turn them around to sure. the audience as well. Um, Here's and a grandma we'll, with her child walking through contaminated soil, or through contaminated area. This is continuous work that Medi continues to say that it doesn't happen and everything ha is, is fine and dandy. They say that they don't use water to clean up contaminated area. This is a dumpster where the foreman is washing down clearly. Wow. Are each of those Dust photos, control? 
Are each of those photos identified with the site and location on the back? No, but I can do that. Will you do that? Just yes. so that we have absolute clarity about what we're looking at and, sure. and what Mike is looking at going forward. I can do that. Thank you. This is me being forced to go up a truck that lifts because the contractor wants to just hurry up and go and he wanted to split. Instead of doing two drives, he wanted to do uh, one trip and had me go up there and separate the material. Even though I told him that, that I know we can all agree that that is not OSHA standards. This one is very important because I expressed concerns about having a un unsafe workplace with the strength of the clothesline, which happens a lot. So consequently, uh, about a month ago, one of the workers, community workers, hit the string line with the pickaxe, punctured his lung, collapsed his lung, two millimeters off his aorta, or he would have died. And the worker's main concern was, when are you coming back? Uh, the worker is scared to come because he is a prior convict. He's just happy to work. He was forced to come back two weeks, and those two weeks, they made it difficult to pay him. Um, he is scared to talk because he feels that this is the only job he can get. And here is a, another community worker's finger. I'm sure you have probably saw this. You should have, right? His finger got cut off. He was put to work back the next day. Right? This is something that regardless if the worker says you can come back, there's no way he should come back. With that said, I do want to thank the committee. And I hope I don't take this much, and my time hasn't started, because I do think these pictures are important. I just want to say thank you for creating the space, but I do think it's important to be transparent. And it's been, I've been here since 2018. I've been fired about five times because I speak up. I'm fortunate that I'm able to write an email, find out, research, Google, include DTSC, so I can fight for my job, because the union did, did nothing. The first thing the union, will, the union will say is, well, where's the proof? And if you don't have proof, and if you have a paper trail, if you don't have anything, you can't defend yourself. That is the only reason I'm still working. I understand mistakes will happen once, twice, maybe three times. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We have witnesses here. A person, a community worker almost died. That's no longer a coincidence. That is a culture, and that those are habits. And DTSC is enabling this by not allowing it to be transparent, and it will continue to happen. The contractor keeps hiring previous workers. We have a worker that mocked and ridiculed the tamale lady, was fired from the previous contractor. The new contractor has no accountability and doesn't know anything about the previous workers, hires them, and he's currently working right now. And this is something that continuously happens. And unless we're transparent about it and we talked about it, then we can change it. I've made num numerous attempts to Medi, who says he glorifies the work source participants, and so does Meredith, and I've included Meredith on these emails, and to no avail. For a program that you glorify, there is not one person dedicated to that program. With all the funding that comes in, you're telling me that there's not one person. Medi says Andres is in charge. If you guys Google Andres, it has him still in charge of that. But if you Google him of what his real position is, we know that he is not anything related with the work source participant. So I think it's very important as a work source participant to have a voice and to have somebody that people can rely on. We thought we were making progress with Grant. I'm not sure if he was being, if it was because he was leaving or it was because his intentions were true. Meredith said vulnerable, right? These are vulnerable communities. And what happens with these vulnerable communities is they don't trust the government. Why? Because you come in, you do something, and you think that's it. This project has been going and going, and it's not just it. You have to have intent. It has to be intentional. It can't just be, oh, we cleaned it up, we're gone. No, there has to be intention. There's no intent with what you're doing right now. Everything is short-term. Nothing is long-term. You keep thinking it's going to be a short-term thing, and it's already almost going on 10 years. And it's not going to stop because we're still fighting for it. It's time that you guys take it a little bit more serious and consider putting more effort on that part of the community part. I do like that I hear that a lot about the inclusivity, especially with the committee, but I do think that 
DTSC needs to work on that. Medi promised me an email two, three months ago. He still hasn't replied. Mr. Reyes. And I can include you. I can tell you that he doesn't include us because he just did a survey where he said he didn't care about the community because he wanted to be unbiased. He brought a group from Utah to do this survey, excluded us. We just had a, a, a meeting two months ago and doesn't mention it. And then when we ask him, he just says, we didn't want to include you because we wanted to be unbiased. I don't know how that include, how that makes inclusivity. Just to wrap this up, I do think that everybody wants to reap the benefits of this project, including the contractor. One of the main project managers from NEC, Gary the Villa, I'm not sure exactly what you say his name, but he's the main contractor, owns one of the subcontractor companies, SFNS. So a couple of months back, they were supposed to bring a group in and he brings this new contractor. Nobody knew what's going on. I had to Google it. And it turns out he's the he's sponsoring this, and it says he owes up to 10%. It could be more. I don't know. It doesn't state exactly what. My point is, if he can reap the benefits, why can't we? If he's double dipping, why can't we ask for stuff ourselves for our community? I leave that with that, and I, I appreciate your time. I'm sorry if I come up passionate, but I think that we need to be transparent. And I will hopefully hear from Eddie now or Meredith in regards to the emails that we've been sending. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you all for that. I appreciate that that comment. We'll uh, you'll provide us with the materials, which I think uh, Mike will also be interested in, and and Lizette, and obviously DTSC. So thank you for that. Um, that's a perspective that we didn't hear yesterday. So uh, I welcome that. Thank you. Any additional comments? So we will move, um, that was the only comment card that I received for this agenda item. I will now move to um, checking in with our Verizon operator. Wait, hang on a minute, Jess. All the other, okay. I will, uh, so I will call them out and if you're not for this agenda item, then um, please let us know and I will save it for our um, next item. So we are currently on agenda item eight, which is the Exide update. There will also be an opportunity at the end of the agenda um, for anyone commenting for items not on the agenda. Um, but if you are commenting on this particular item, agenda item eight, uh, we ask that I'm going to read the comment cards that I have um, and then uh, take call, um, comments from our uh, from our call in lines and then anybody with raised hands. So if you have not had the opportunity, um, so starting with, yes. Yeah, so um, just also, um, again, if this is in relationship to um, Exide update, um, then please, this, this would be your opportunity. If you are commenting about the site visits or community tours that occurred yesterday, there is a separate space for that on the agenda. Um, so if you, if you could save that for that time, um, but for right now, and again, I'm going to call out the names on the comment cards. If your comment is in relationship to specifically the Exide update, um, please join us at the podium. So I have uh, Chantel Mu uh, Munoz. Okay. If you can please state your name and affiliation for the record before starting your comment, please. Hello, my name is Chantel Munoz. I am a community resident of City of Bella. My affiliation is with the East Yards community. Now, the reason I'm here is I'm a community resident of City of Bell. This community project was worked in my area and it's still in my area. Now, the reason I'm here is because I was a witness of a uh, we could say not a very nice situation that happened early in the morning with these fellow workers, this crewmate, um, by one of the, we could say supervisors of subcontractors and contractors. It was 7.30 in the morning. He just came in with their timesheets. I was a witness. I saw it and I heard it all. He just belittled them all, told them to stop doing what they were doing, that it wasn't right what they were doing, but yet 
they're the field workers and they know what they were doing at 7.30. Why? Because a crew member, the leader of them was running late, which his name is Melvin. At that moment, he was running late. Now, as well, before all this, I had an experience with that leader, Melvin. I went through a bit of, it's called sexual harassment with him. He falls acute accused me and one of the workers as well, his name is Mike, false accused me of me and him of a moment that it wasn't true, nothing happened. It wasn't right as one of the leaders of that crew division that's just supposed to be working in the property that they need to be doing. Now as well, this subcontractor and contractor 30 second. in charge belittled these workers and it's not right because these workers know what they're doing and they have their right to speak up. Now, Pete Reyes spoke up for them, and unfortunately, the division got separated, this crew, and it's not right, because they know what they're doing with this project. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you for that comment, and I assume that complaint has been forwarded in some other form besides right here, right now? Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, I have Rania Sabti. On behalf of, okay, and into the microphone, please. Yeah, so um, Rania's at a college orientation for her son, so she sent a message. Um, so she said, I've served on the Excite Technologies Advisory Group, ETAG, since November 2016. I'm currently working at UCLA uh, Loesch. I have been a professor in environmental and occupational health for over 20 years. I'm an industrial hygienist and a registered environmental health specialist. One of the main concerns of the ETAG since its inception has been the health and safety of workers involved in the testing cleanup of contaminated residential sites. UCLA Loche, where I'm currently employed, was an organization that collaborated with DTSC staff many years ago to support the development and impl implementation of workforce development program work by providing much of the health and safety training classes for workers in the first First, multiple cohorts had entered the Excite work, Workforce Development Program. In the past few months, I have seen many records of dust air monitoring data and airborne lead exposure collected at cleanup sites. I was able to get access to this info because of a PRA, a request I placed in 2021. I also had a chance to participate on site visits to two residential cleanup sites in 2021. Most recently, on 6-6-2022, I met with, with Mehdi, Jeff, Mustafa, and Steven to learn more about how worker health and safety is addressed at the sites. It's been concerning to note multiple misalignments between DTSC's actions and DTSC's intent to build trust with the community and to protect workers' health and safety. The following are issues of concern. Data collection, evidence-based decision-making, and transparent data sharing. Data is collected for, airport, for airborne levels of dust and lead at contaminated cleanup sites. 30 seconds. This data are collected by contractors. Data is shared with DTSC only if an issue is flagged. Otherwise, the data remains with the contractor until they release them in a final closure report. The final closure report is submitted to property owners months after the cleanup has ended. It is hundreds of pages long and contains very technical information. Data are not shared with the DTSC staff in real time and do not appear to inform daily action plans by DTSC staff for addressing current health and safety issues. This data are not communicated to workers. Workers are not being informed about their exposure to dust and airborne lead on the job. The data... Enclosure reports are shared with residents in a format and at a level of technical difficulty that make it non-accessible to community members. The data are shared with community residents after exposure has occurred and not in a timely fashion. The ETEC has received sparse info about worker exposure Time. data in the past six years. I will email y'all the rest of her letter because it's significantly longer than what I can read in two minutes. Uh, is it that one that's there? That's correct. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So you'll this will be the first time you're providing this information to us and to, to you all, yes. The agency has been having this information. Okay, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, and um our next comment card is from Mark Lopez. You have a multiple personality going on. Yes. <laughs> Hi. So um I'm the, the co-chair of the XI Techno Advisory Group along with Meredith. Um, and I think more than anything, uh, just here to, to provide support to folks that came out today. Uh, I wasn't planning to come out. I've 
been out of the country, out of the state, out of the city a lot, um, including today. Within a couple of hours, I need to jump on a plane out of the country. But when folks say we need to be here, we need to be here, right? And so I think more than anything, uh, I just want to point to what has been a common culture amongst a lot of agencies where a lot of our fight is trying to prove that something isn't working. And a lot of agency staff, not just at DTSC, but all over the place, the posture is everything is working, right? My spreadsheet says everything is working, right? My staff report says everything is working. So everything must be working because I have a file that says it's working, right? But when you actually get down to the reality in our communities, it's clear that it's not working. And what y'all are getting here is a small representation of that, right? Um, and there's many factors as to why folks aren't here, as Pete mentioned earlier, the time of this meeting, um, disillusionment from bringing issues up in the past and not getting addressed, intimidation, all these types of things, right? Um, and there's been tons of transitions recently within the department. So I think it's actually making it even more difficult than it was before. But ultimately, seconds. right now, the contractor, we, the current contractor, we feel is unsuitable. They have a track record that is terrible. There's a new contract coming for hundreds of millions of dollars from the state public funds. And we don't think this contractor is appropriate to get that new contract. We think we're in the exact right position to transition to a different contractor, and we should take that opportunity. And also, DTSC hasn't done a sufficient job to oversee the cleanup. And I think we're at a point right now where US EPA is also getting involved, where we have an opportunity to re-examine what that looks like, right? To, to shift and ensure that moving forward, we correct course and hold contractors accountable as we move forward. Time. We've been committed to that. We remain committed to that. And that's why I'm here today. Thank you. Thank you. I just wanted to comment that um, board member Sushma and board member Georgette did meet with East Yard communities yesterday did meet with East Yard Communities yesterday. So you will have an opportunity to, we have an hour if you want to share more comments. I just wanted to make that known that you will have a bit more time to comment um, coming up in the next agenda item as well if we are short on time right now. Thank you. Okay, so the next comment card that we have is from Guadalupe Valdivino. Um, you will have two minutes to comment, and um, please state your name and an, any affiliation for the record into the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Guadalupe Valdovinos. I live in East Los Angeles uh, within the 1.7 radius lead contamination by Exide. So good morning. Thank you for having me here. Um, so I'm here to urge the council and DTSC not to contract the cleaning crew, National Engineering and Consulting Company, uh, group, also known as NEC, because they are not professional. They do not meet the expectations. The reps who give the overview plans are completely detached from the actual cleanup crew. They promise that they will clean up your home, but because of so many middlemen, everything gets lost in translation. There is no one direct source to bring to attention any problems or complaints, such as in my personal experience with these workers. They are rude, intimidating. We have them in our home for weeks at a time, and they make you feel as you are a guest in your own home. We need to accommodate to their cleanup efforts by being a part of the cleanup. They told us to move many of our plants and that many would not be resoiled. My father, a 70-year-old man, had to do a pre-landscaping modification in order for them to come into our home to clean. There was a clear runoff of soil on the street heading into the sewer nearby, but they didn't care. When they were finally done, the crew packed up and left, but we noticed a big patch was not cleaned. We asked them to replace the soil, and they said that there is no time or funding to add to the plants, when in fact it was part of the process. To see firsthand mismanagement of taxpayer money by an intimidating company who clearly is only out for pay is a devastating blow to my community. Exide no longer exists, but the damage lives on, and the lack of proper cleanup by this company, it is up to you, DTSC, to do better. 
I strongly encourage you all to care for my community and the communities around me because every single dollar should be accounted for properly. Do not make the mistake that will cost us more in the long run. Our health is already at stake. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a theme going here. Um, I, I, I think, yeah. um, we'll make the announcement in a second. Okay. okay. Um, so I want to thank you for those comments. And I'm also hearing... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll say it. I'm also hearing, uh, as you set up the forum and you set up the comment period and the establishment of the next phase, this is an opportunity for us to bring these to bear. And uh, I know we'll be in dialogue with DTSC about it, and I'm sure that as we go forward with the um, EPA work, these will be important issues to address, correct. And uh, so please provide us these things in writing as well. I, I'm sure that will help um, the agency look at it um, through your lens. And this is so important that we're hearing this. So thank you again for being there. I think we have an announcement. Um, Two announcements. I just want to clarify again that this comment period is specifically about the EPA um, presentation that Michael did about Exide. We also had meetings with board members yesterday with East Yard Environmental um, Community. Sorry, I'm, this is stuck. Um, about Exide, where you will have more than two minutes. To, for us to hear your um, comments and concerns. And so I just wanted to make that known that we will have additional time as it relates to everything that you all have been sharing. But I also just wanted to clarify that if there's any specific questions um, for Mike um, as, as he is here, because I know your time is limited with us today. So I just wanted to make that known if there's specific questions, um, please <coughs> ask them right now. Great. And also there's a silver car that has to be moved, if anybody is... There's a silver car with Nevada plates on this side of the building. Um, it is in the council um, parking spaces. If you would please move your vehicle immediately. Okay. Any other comments? So we have six more comment cards. Um, and again, like um, our executive officer is stating, um, if you would like to have a little bit more time to say your comment, there will be a an extended hour long comment peer, um, comment in, uh, interactive um, after this item. Um, if your question is directly related to um, the announcement from US EPA, then um, please comment during this item. So um, I have six more comment cards left. I'm going to read your names. If you would like to express your comment, please come up to the podium. Um, Cruz Becerra? No. Um, oh. Husafe Mohammed Iman Udin? Okay. Uh, Deanna Sanchez? Again, you'll have two minutes to comment and please state your name and affiliation for the record. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Is it good enough? Okay. Hello, my name is Deanna Sanchez. I am from Southeast LA. I am here with East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice. Um, and I want to appreciate your time. I do know many people aren't available to speak during this um, hour. And so I do feel privileged to speak in front of the council, especially representatives from the US EPA, DTSC. Um, I think it's important that y'all hear this message since I don't always get the opportunity to speak in front of representatives. Um, I currently am leading some outreach efforts in East LA, uh, specifically within the DTSC testing zone and outside of the 1.7 mile radius, between a uh, four and a half mile radius, um, testing for lead contamination in the soil of community members. Um, 
and while I cannot speak for them because they can't be here, I can share some of the stories and things that I have seen firsthand while outside door knocking. And I have seen many homes and many community members who are jaded and discouraged by the experience they have with the cleanup efforts, rather being that their soil was tested and they have been waiting to get their soil cleaned up for months on end, sometimes even years, and feel really uncomfortable in their own home with their children. Um, I have seen home members who have had some parts of, for example, a garage or a um, attachment home flooded because the contractor team did not um, level the soil correctly and the home that they invested in for years was flooded with me. Um, with broken concrete that wasn't doing a good job, then having to spend their own savings to re, um, to put their own block on the ground. Um, and a lot of the samples I have tested have come out extremely high within the thousands range and more. And these folks are waiting to get their homes clean. And so I hope there is more of a priority and collaboration. Thank you. Thank you. And again, any of these uh, specific concerns, I hope you communicate them in writing with more details. I think that's that's the only way they can go through a process. Is that is that how you want that to happen? I, I think you know this is this is a record, right? We, right. we are hearing this is a record. I, don't, I mean, additional detail is always helpful, but yes. it's not it's not certainly the only thing we can act on. I understand. So. Yes, we're saying that this is a record now. You are on record with these comments. They will be heard. If there's more detail or more specific contact persons or anything else that you want to elaborate on, then please, please do that as well. Thank you. I think especially so that we can share with all of the board members any written records, because there might have been things that you had shared with DTSC previously, but we don't necessarily have access to that. So if you can email the board um, email address that's up here or call me, email me, um, just so that I can share it with all of the board members, that would be helpful. Thank you. Okay, so we have uh, three more comment cards. Again, I will read off the names if this is specific to the um, Excite update. Um, uh, you can go ahead and come up to the podium. And if this is not specific to the X site update and you would like to comment on a future item, I will save your comment card. Um, and then after I read the comment cards, I know that we have some folks that are in queue um, uh, who have called in and would like to express themselves as well. So there will be time for that after these three comment cards, just letting you all know. Thank you all for your patience. Um, so the next comment card that I have is Ryan Snyder. Um, thank you so much. You will have two minutes to speak. Please state your name and any affiliation for the record. Hi, good, uh, good morning. Uh, Ryan Snyder, East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice. And I'm just another testimony of the poor quality that the contractors have been doing out there in the neighborhoods. Um, I went to the Wyvern Wood um, cleanup. Put your mic up a little bit so more, yeah, a little closer to the mic. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, I went to the Wyvern Wood cleanup. And what I witnessed there and uh, what the tenants showed me was that the contractors broke a water line and that water line brought all the contaminated soil out into the parking lot. So when I was there, I looked at the parking lot and there was just dirt all over the parking lot. And there's people getting out of their car with their kids, you know, and tracking that dirt everywhere. So uh, just wanted to reiterate the importance of um, this, all the money we're spending here for these contractors uh, it, it has to be quality work or else uh, we're just spinning our wheels. Um, and um, there needs to be more involvement with the community. Uh, I don't think there's anybody here from the Wyvernwood uh, facility or from the residential area. So um, I'm happy to he be here and at least uh, describe what they're going through there because um, without a, a proper cleanup and quality contractors, there's no justice for uh, those people there. So um, please uh, find a way to ensure that these contractors are doing quality work so that the money is spent properly and the people get justice. Thank, Thank you. you for that. And again, I'm sure we'd welcome more specific details about location or timing issues. It'll be easier to 
to to sort through it um, than than a general area where there's a problem with a contractor. If there's something specific that you can elaborate on, that would be helpful, and you can communicate that with us, and and we'll be sharing and and having these dialogues, and especially as we're preparing for uh, a forum uh, with community input when. Um, you all come on board, which we're counting on, uh, then we'll have another opportunity to ensure that we, you know, we correct any issues. I'm sure DTSC is committed to that. So, okay. Any other comments? Yes. Um, so, Iralmi Swakaro. Hi. Good, good morning. Thank you to the board for being here. Um, I, grew, um, I grew up in East LA, Boyle Heights, and I'm with Communities for a Better Environment. Um, I had a couple of uh, questions regarding the NPL status listing uh, or decision to petition, um, right? So uh, first off, I, you know, we're, we need this money desperately to clean up the facility and the surrounding areas. Just I, I wanted to ask what is the average time for cleanup in the area for a super fun site um, and then also how much time is expected for the XI cleanup or facility cleanup if it is listed on the site of, I'm sorry, on the super list super fun list um, so two questions there but I also wanted to raise um, how this process has even from now not yet been a community process we haven't heard from DTSC about um, the fact that they haven't even requested to meet with community orgs or CVE about this uh, potential listing and decision to petition. And so I just wanted to raise a flag of the fact that it hasn't been a community process yet. And so we need that to start now very early in the process and uh, hope that EPA also takes this opportunity given the amount of community engagement that you see here and that has happened historically that you make this process very different from any other super fun site listing because um, we, we've been waiting for a very, very long time already and we need action now. Um, and I just want to point to two more things on regarding the next slide. Um, I ask the board to hold a special session regarding Excite because there's so many issues regarding the residential cleanup process, the quality of cleanup, but also the worker protection issues. We need a special session here in the community to really uh, hold DTSC accountable and make sure there's more transparency in the process. And I'd also like to ask that the Excite ETAG meetings, uh, um, community meetings, be held in person. Um, and I know, you know, there's a lot of issues with COVID and there's, still, you know, COVID is not over, but we need this process and, and you see a lot of engagement in the back. This is what we've been waiting for for a very long time because Zoom is not compatible to really addressing the needs that our communities have. So we really want you to push, push you to make sure that these ETAG meetings happen in person. So thank you. Thank you so thank much for you. your comment. Um, if you can just stay up really quickly. Any comments on, uh, on questions. Mike or... Yeah. Sorry, you you had two questions at the beginning. If you could just repeat those for Mike, please. Okay. Yeah. I'll, um, what is the average time of cleanup for, for a super fun site here in the area? Um, and then, what is the expected, you know, years of clean or timeline of cleanup for the X site if it is listed? Thank you. Thank you. So, um, you know there. Superfund sites come in a variety of different forms. So, you know, cleaning up groundwater, for example, takes decades, can take decades. Um, cleaning up, you know, uh, soils in residential or industrial communities, you know, can range from a couple of years to many years long, as I think has been the experience here as the state has, you know, tried to clean up residential properties. Um, and so it's very difficult to say, you know, uh, you know what the average time is, you know, it, and and the the process for listing is in our statute and regulation. So unfortunately, you know, we don't have the flexibility to take a different approach to putting a site on the national priorities list. It's 
it's unfortunately it's pretty hardwired into our regulation and statute. So uh, that process of listing a site, um, you know, uh, takes you know a, a year to two years. Um, but as I'd mentioned, you know, we are going to um, start working right away with the state to identify opportunities and synergies for keeping the project moving forward. So hopefully that answers your question. So, uh, Mike, you're on record um, as wanting to work with us to expedite it, and I, I really, we really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, any comments from DTSC on the question that was asked about the process? About the process? No. I mean, just sharing as much information. Again, we're going to have a this in August. We'll have a retreat. We'll get everybody who needs to be there in the room so that DTS. DTSC understands what EPA needs. We provide the information and we chart the course forward. I don't know what that says. I don't know what the word is. Just a second, we're doing a little. Okay. Okay. Um, so uh, the last comment card that I have for this agenda item, and then we will move to our um, those folks who have called in, which we have four callers that would like to make a comment on this item. We have Stephanie Dillard. Hello, my name is Stephanie Dillard. I represent the Southeast Los Angeles community. Um, I just wanted to thank you guys for having this opening for us. Um, I've done from sampling to laboring to operating to putting profiles together for these companies. And I could tell you these companies are doing everything wrong. They're contaminating the, um, the crosswalk, the parkways they are contaminating the crosswalks, everything. And they don't even um, use the proper procedures. They don't do protocols because they're too much in a hurry to get things done. And a lot of people would be here, but there's so much hostile environment in, in, these, in these companies. And it's just ridiculous that we have to do like this type of issues when we're being poisoned and we're being poisoned and poisoned. We're being poisoned by the chemicals. We're being poisoned by the mental, the mental things, the mental harassment that these people are doing. And I'm telling you, you're going to have a bigger issue if you keep on contracting these companies. Because I could tell you that I see who's doing it, what right, what foremans are doing what wrong. And I could tell you that there's so much hostile towards the community. I could say, tell you what some of these foremans feel about this community. Oh, I don't care. I don't live here. Oh, well, it's all dirty anyways. Or they have all this all this type of hostile towards this community and you guys are paying them really good wages for them to just think of us as like we're dirt. 30 seconds. I got told I was dirt by NEC. And I'm telling you, I, I'm an indigenous person here. I have multiple family members that have cancer. I have multiple family members that have ADHD. I have all kinds of issues that I could report to you guys. And I have reported to a lot of you guys and nobody's doing anything about it. I reported to DTSC how huh? they're contaminating. And all I get from them is, oh, well, we're friends. We don't want to, we don't want to rock the boat. Multiple DTSC said that to me. Time. And I told them, why are you guys cross-contaminating? Why are you letting them bring clean dirt when you're, you're not even done removing the dirty dirt? Oh, well, 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 where's the dirt? I go, how do you not see? You still have the plastic on and you're bringing in clean dirt? I, for me, we got to get rid of all DTSC to begin with because... The way I see it is they're in cahoots with the companies and nobody's doing anything about it. All they see is friendship and I, that's not your job to be a company's friend. Your job is to look out for the community. That's all I have to say about that for now. Thank you for your comment, your passion. And I know these issues are going, they're, they're not going to disappear into a set of minutes. So thank you. Okay, and so to our callers, um, we have, 
uh, Valerie, if you could um, allow to speak the first um, caller from the English line. Jenny Knack, your line is open. Please state your affiliation. Hi, um, I wanted to speak on the, not directly on X side, so maybe I should wait. I wanted to speak on the community visits that happened yesterday. Yes, we will have that later. If you would um, stay in queue and we will have Valerie um, uh, have you be the first caller to express your comment on that item. Valerie. Okay, perfect. I'll wait. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And to the uh, next uh, caller. Valerie. Yvonne Watson, your line is open. Please state your affiliation. Hi, this is Yvonne Watson. Again, I'm the chair of the Environmental Social Justice Committee for the Sierra Club Angeles Chapter. I am a Montebello resident, and I have been following the exile issues since 2015. Um, as a resident of Montebello, I lived in an area that is currently being investigated right now by USC as part of a new ongoing mapping project to extend the area of investigation out to around five miles. So I take this very personally because I feel that my family was very possibly exposed. Um, I'm hoping that this board will pay attention to the comments being made by East Yard Communities for Environmental Justice. I am so happy to see Mark Lopez and all of his team there. But I also want you to please pay attention to the people who are not in the room. These are the people representing the Resurrection Catholic Church in Boyle Heights and other environmental justice organizations who have been working on this from the very beginning. Some of these organizations I contacted as soon as I found out about the meeting in Montebello, they did not know that this meeting was taking place today. Some of them have commented on this new EPA uh, Superfund site proposal, and they were against it for various reasons. I am hoping that those people will contact you in writing. But my main concern is that I keep hearing about how DTSD and now this board is looking for greater participation. And I can tell you, in the past, before COVID, these meetings were packed. And just looking at the room right now, it's like it does not surprise me that there's hardly anyone here at Montebello. Uh, before I got sick, I used to attend those meetings at the Montebello City Council. 30 and seconds. They were more of a stadium seat. And those seats were really packed together, so I'm glad to see there's, there's both seats have been removed. But I want you to know, you need to pay attention to the environmental justice organizations that are not present in today's room. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. And we're hearing that people didn't know about the meeting, so obviously we have to do a better job of that. And uh, to the extent that people can sign up for on our website for our alerts where we note, send out email notices. And if there's other ways through your organizations, I think, I think we should add organizational contacts to our list so that we can go through the leadership <clears throat> of the various organizations who've been represented here today and inform you. So um, let's put that on our, excuse me. <clears throat> on our list of activities so that we, we communicate directly with the people and their representative organizations. So please um, let us know how to do that and we'll, we'll be sure we do. Okay, so um, thank you, Jeannie. So we have uh, one more comment from our English line and one from our Spanish. Um, Valerie, if you could um, uh, allow permissions to speak for the, for the caller on the English line. Cynthia Babich, your line is open. Please state your affiliation. Hi, my name is Cynthia Babich. I'm the director of the Delamo Action Committee, and I'm also the coordinator for the Los Angeles Environmental Justice Network. Um, so my initial reaction when I heard about this becoming a Superfund site possibly was, yikes, quite literally. 
Um, I have been working on the Delamo Mantra sites for almost 30 years now, um, often very closely with Mike Montgomery, and it's good to see you, Mike. I look forward to working with you in the future. And uh, I appreciate what I heard in your earlier comments, and um, I do think there needs to be a lot of changes, and I'm happy to hear about the MOU with Cal EPA and EPA and hear your insights on having more of a partnership than a hierarchy system where the state simply concurs with EPA's decision-making. I think there's a lot of things that need to be taken into consideration. I have a really big concern about the burden shifting of removing soil from one community and putting into another. I think that there's two different kinds of roles for the people to be involved, um, and one is with advocates who have been with Superfund process and cleanup processes for a long time and could really share our insights on how things could work better, and then the role of the impacted communities that you've heard from today who have it very well under control. But before people can move on with a failed process, you have to take the time to work with the people who are coming to you today and impacted so that you can reach a place of confidence and ground to move forward from. Otherwise, you're just continuing down a bad path. And I see community people didn't make it, but I see Chuck White in the audience there representing industry, and it's just Time. amazing how they always seem to be in the know. So uh, thanks again for your efforts, and we remain a resource. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, so I was mistaken. I there's a just so everybody knows there's a chat that I'm allowed to have with the Verizon operator, so I can see who's uh, commenting. It kind of helps facilitate the meeting. Um, she said there are no Spanish commenters, um, and I read it as there's one Spanish commenter. So we can actually now um, we have no more call-in commenters, so we can now move to the next agenda item. No, great. So. Is there any board? Yes. The next part is board discussion about what we just heard or any questions for Mike. Um, Georgette. Yeah, thank you. And uh, my questions are directed to Mike and, and the presentation and the partnership, which I'm, 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 I'm very happy about and happy to learn more about it. Uh, the questions that I have are um, just in terms of super funds in general, not related to, to this particular request, who can start a process? Can the community start a process to to see if a site can be um, uh, approached as a super fund with EPA? Or what's, what does that look like? Yeah, we, could, we can receive a petition from a community to consider a site mm -hmm. um, or to conduct a, a preliminary assessment Okay. which would then gather the data that would be used to uh, determine whether or not a site would score. So, yeah, we, we, we get referrals from counties, from environmental groups, from, uh, you know, a variety of different groups. We'll get petitions okay. to evaluate a site. Okay, thank you. Just we're, um, we're wondering about that. And then they're related to this particular um, request. Um, Within the request, and I don't know if it's been already included, but I know that we'll report back in relation to our tour um, on, on the next side. Um, and one of the things that we heard is right now the scope is for 1.6 radius mile, right? It is the request to um, allocate this as a super fund. Did that increase the radius or is it still within 1.7 miles? Or if that was, was that referred to at all, the request? Just curious if we know. So, so Mike, are you looking to DTSC or you have, I think the question is, are you limited to the current scope of Correct. seven miles? Is there, how does that work? Or was that defined yeah. at all? I, 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 don't, I don't want to speak for Mike because uh, I, um, the DTSC defined the 1.7 miles based on some modeling as, as the preliminary. We always called it the preliminary investigation area. Um, 
but EPA has to go through their own process. And that's one reason why it's important for us to share the data, why they're going to be looking at it. They're gonna take their own experts and do their own modeling and make their own determinations. And with that, I turn it to Mike. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, we'll look at all the data and the basically the language of the statutes, it's, you know, the, the site, um, when we list a site, we'll, we'll have to define boundaries. But once we've begin the investigation, assuming there's, you know, additional investigation that's needed to determine the extent of contamination that's gone beyond the property itself, the industrial property itself, um, our investigation, you know, our, our language is really that, you know, we can uh, investigate sites and determine wherever the contaminants have come to be located. Okay. And then when we go through our um, risk assessment and remedy selection process, then we'll determine kind of what the range of uh, area that is it will be cleaned up or would be considered. Okay, you know, I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, I think uh, there's, um, hearing from the community, I think there's an, an interest of having that, be, being part of that dialogue as research is getting conducted. Um, and then lastly, um, in terms of timing and in, in, in relation to community input, what would that look like? Or community engagement, if you can kind of speak to in relation to the Superfund. Well, moving forward. I, yeah, I mean, s some of the, you know, s some of the groups were in communication with, um, but, uh, you know, I think we've really got to sit down. We, like I've said, EPA's had some involvement in our, through our RICRA program, and we have a website. We put a banner up on the website, to, the RICRA website, to let people know that the request has come from the state to consider this for a Superfund site. And um, I think... Part of what we want to talk about in the retreat when we have that is, um, you know, just uh, in this interim period while we're considering listing, uh, what 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 role does the state want us to have in the public process? Okay. It's, you know, and... Um, it's to be determined. Though. Yeah, it's kind okay. of to be determined. I mean, I think that, uh, um, you know, the, the time frame when we're considering listing a site is a time when we're sort of, we're not entirely, you know, committed to the project. But we, in this case, this project is so evolved that we would want to definitely lean in probably more on community engagement than we normally would. Okay. And I lied one more follow-up to this, and I promise that would be it. Um, in relation to this retreat that is going to happen between EPA and DT DTSC, what would be the report back of that outcome to the board, if any, and in addition to that, what would be the opportunity for the board to engage in how this agreement is moving forward? What would be the transparency of all of this, of all these different departments getting together for the board and the, and the public? Well, we certainly will commit to reporting back, not just to you, but through the commun community meetings we have and through the ETAG. We need to make sure that everybody's aware about how that process moves forward. Um, and I agree, hopefully, and it'll be an in-person ETAG meeting. Um, and there are certainly some frustrations on both sides with the virtual ones, just as an okay. aside. Great. So, but, sorry, couldn't resist. It's harder to hear you. Can oh, you pull sorry. for just a minute? Okay, so, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll report out to the communities through the ETAG and the community meetings, but we can also, um, happy to agendize this and report back to you uh, about you know what the outcomes are, what what agreements we came to, and how the process is going to move forward. That that be no problem. Again, I, EPA is trying to put as much information of, up on their website. We will do um, similar. Okay. Oh, oh, that's great, um, and and thank you for that. Um, I, I would request that not only do we get a report back, but an opportunity to engage, if possible. Yeah. If there's I, any opportunity, maybe. Yeah, I think know, that's part of the public. discussion. Okay. Is, you know, it, it, I I personally have never been involved in the Superfund listing process. So we're all, for, for a lot of us in the department, this is a new exercise. I know a lot of folks, past folks, have had more experience with that. And so we just have to figure out what that looks like. Great. And Thank I you. think we're hearing a great deal of interest in our engagement and community engagement in the process. And so we stand yeah. ready to be part of that. Mm -hmm. And we'll determine amongst 
ourselves as a board, whether we'll have a designated <coughs> liaison to the process or how we'll do that so that between meetings we have the opportunity to, to understand better um, and also connect back. So I think the public engagement piece of this, mm -hmm. both the DTSC's public engagement, our own, um, I think you all know that we, um, we have uh, staffing positions for um, ombuds, right? And we'll be hearing more about that from Swathi, but uh, roles like that are going to be very important as a way to keep the flow coming to us and back to the community. So working, we have a lot of work to do on this. We've identified it as a priority area in terms of the intersection of DTSC, this board, our staff, the communities, um, to, to have those relationships. I don't want to say they'll be seamless, but they need to be continuous and so, and intentional. And I think uh, we're all committed to that. So thank you. Any, uh, Sushma, did you have something? No, Swathi, Sushma, not Swathi. No. Thank you. Uh, uh, clarifying, thank you. Uh, clarifying question for you, Mike. Uh, you talked about the fact that the EPA will do its own investigation. So my question is, will that investigation involve a desk review of the data that's already been collected by DTSC, or will you be also sampling and collect, collecting, creating your own data? The context for the question is that if you look at the data that exists, you might draw the same conclusion versus trying to identify new data sources. Can I add to that? Um, my my question is similar, um, but it also focused on identifying data gaps, whether or not the current information available has been substantial to, to determine the um, extent of contamination. Um, I understand prevailing winds have been considered in the distribution of the pollution, um, and uh, my... There's just, you know, the, this facility operated for so long, and uh, my concern is is really um, figuring out the dispersal and, and the extent and, and, and the accumulation of dispersal. And um, I understand that um, the, you know, the 1.7 mile radius has been prioritized for now based on available funds. So um, I, I, I do have a, a, a deep concern about um, keeping it at that point, um, and 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 would personally pushed to to have that extended and um, yeah so uh, th there will be a, a point at which we'll, we'll need to collect some data I mean certainly uh, with uh, uh, the need to, to probably do additional characterization at the facility itself mm -hmm. in the Vado zone and groundwater and surrounding areas surface industrial properties uh, my understanding is that there's a Need for additional data, uh, potentially around the with the industrial properties. Um, as as far as the residential properties are concerned, and the dispersive model, um, I, we're gonna we're gonna work with DTSC and un, try and understand what data is available. I, I, I appreciate and understand that there are some um, uh, c community science efforts. There's some university, you know, some I think you know uh, university led efforts. And um, you know we're we are in we are in turn learning um, more about uh, you know lead in residential soils through our central metals project, and so you know I think there's going to be a lot for us to evaluate. Um, so we'll, we'll we'll review the modeling that went into the exercise, and we'll review the the residential soils data and determine whether or not there is a need to do additional modeling or collect additional data. Um, I think that gets more to your question, uh, for, for uh, your question board member, Badia. Um, my understanding is that with the industrial properties in the source area that there's a need for additional characterization. So I'd say it's pretty likely that we will collect that data. Um, but to that data... Mic, yeah. To the mic, Mike? Sorry. <laughs> <The> mic. <laughs> um, yeah, so... so I, I think there will be additional data collection, um, and uh, we will work closely with DTSC on reviewing the model and the residential soils data. Um, Thank you. May I ask another follow-up? Yeah. 
at one of the topics that came up in our community meetings yesterday was the desire for some community members to have the scope of cleanup cover the interior of the homes. And while there was a, a decision made that DTSC's cleanup efforts would cover the outside of the home, the, 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 the sort of the yard areas and not the interior, would that decision be relitigated once or if the site gets um, designated as a super fun site? Yeah, we have limitations on going indoors, uh, so I, I I I can't really uh, commit to revisiting that. So, is there anything to add to that in terms of interior? Um, you all understood the question was, can you go in the homes? The answer is, there's limitations, right? That you have limitations on that on the interior of homes. Uh, you know, it, was the question in terms of collecting data, or was the question in terms of? Doing, yeah, Clean up. We, we have limitations on doing in indoor dust. And this, this includes like crawl spaces and attics and so on. You wouldn't go in. Yeah, I didn't really anticipate that question, so I need to go back and talk to folks. But my understanding is that we don't. That's not. That's not our practice. So we we would just, if I might, just chime yes, in. Please. We would just. That's part of the conversations. This is not something that we would want to take off the table for homeowners. This is we want to continue to provide this for property owners. So. This would be part of our conversations that we're going to engage in in August. Great. So did everyone hear that? That that conversation is not over, right? Yeah. And I do, I do want to clarify. We do offer um, residents to have their houses cleaned after the, after the remediation is done so that any dust that, any lead that kicked up during that process is, clean, is addressed. The, the Los Angeles County Department of Public Health has a lead, uh, lead paint rem remediation program that we hope community members are aware of. And so, you know, if you're addressing lead, we would love to see it be a holistic solution. We do not go into attics and crawl spaces. So that is... Okay, issue. but this is that intersectionality that we've been talking about, right? So if we're talking about bringing in EPA, we're talking about bringing in the local uh, public health departments, then maybe that's, that's one of the things that we need to do so that we cover the radius that's appropriate, that we cover the outside, we cover the inside, and we have contractors that people can feel confident in. So if I'm whiteboarding the scope, um, all those elements need to be part of the discussion. So we'll encourage bringing in LA County Department of Public Health once you get to your point, or I don't know what the appropriate point to bring them in, but to really um, maybe invite them and, and host some kind of convening so community members can, can um, let them know, unless any of you have already been in touch with them. So the other part is any work that you've already done, I'm sure we'll all want to hear about. So thank you. I guess I would just add that, yeah, we, we, we have done partnering efforts with counties and county health departments to go beyond the scope of our, okay. you know, capabilities to so achieve. So you can partner with the county facilities as well? Potentially, yeah. I Potentially. mean, I think, I think okay. that uh, what Director Williams articulated is, that's the first time I've sort of heard that framework. And so great. Uh, it seems... Uh, okay. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I also wanted to see um, Alexis... Our board member who has um, relegated herself for the moment, but we'll be back. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Okay, Georgette, you had something else? Yeah, just very quickly into um, this uh, coordination. I think, um, sorry, something went into my eye. Uh, I think the intention of us challenging ourselves, the governmental side of this whole process, speaking about intentionality, and, and not just say, well, there's this other department that has another program. If we put ourselves as a resident that is frustrated um, because they've been contaminated, um, it should be on us to try to figure out how do we make a, a, a clear path to do right, right? Not just point to another bureaucratic program that is gonna create more layers. So, I think uh, we should challenge ourselves to try to link as much as possible to make it a one-stop shop to heal the community. So that would be my my request as we're continuing to expand on the this dialogue. How do we do that better? What are the types of agreements that we need to do to ensure that a we we do it correctly holistically? How do we try to? alleviate some of the barriers that government 
different government departments have, even jurisdictions, the local, the state, and the federal, right? What are the types of conversations that we need to do ahead of time before even coming to the community? Because they're going to expect a lot, and they should. Um, but how do we preempt a lot of that? So I just think as we, we go through these conversations, we think about it from that lens. Thank you. Uh, any other comments or discussion from the board? Yes. Thank you, Lizette. Go ahead. So the other question I have. Oh, sorry. The other question I had was regarding um, how to determine who is going to be taking the lead with the super fund um, cleanup if it if it does go through and whether um, the or, or how the air, the types of sites will be prioritized my understanding that is that as as it's happened so far um, you know um, residential um, centers of worship, uh, learning facilities have been prioritized, uh, commercial and industrial properties have not. Um, at what, in what place will those come through? Public spaces like, um, 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 like the um, streetscapes, what, will those be included? And, and, and how will they be prioritized as well? Um, a lot of our communities lack a lot of green space. And so oftentimes a lot of, you know, we play wherever we find space, wherever we find shade. And oftentimes those can be the medians in, in, in a residential area or, or near a residential area. So will those be included? Thank you. So um, I, I guess the, I'm, I'm trying to, so the question was really towards how do we prioritize the and what, what will be included well with, you know any any contamination that's a that provides a pathway to exposure is of concern and you know through our risk assessment process we would look at the different sets of assumptions around those exposures and we would, um, as, as we always try and do, address the most significant risk first. So that's often why we're focusing on um, the most vulnerable communities when we prioritize our work. Uh, and um, I, th I think at this point, that's sort of the best answer that I have, is that we let the risk drive our prioritization process. And until we better understand the risks and the configurations, you know, um, that drive those risks in terms of local land use, uh, it's harder for me, for me to be more specific. You know, in, in terms of working with local government, I think that um, uh, there are, I, I think that there are potential benefits of having EPA involved here in terms of maybe leveraging uh, Brownfields funding or leveraging other efforts that we might be able to do towards um, su supporting uh, land use decisions that might create more green space and more safe space for uh, the community. I, I can't, you know, that's, it doesn't happen frequently, but occasionally we find synergies in working with local government to create those opportunities. And I'm sure the state's already looked at those too. So I think part of it is understanding what DTSC has already done to explore those opportunities. But um, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Any other comments from Sushma? Thank you. Uh, my comment is building on the comment that Georgette made earlier. Uh, this concept of intersectionality has come up a few times with various jurisdictions holding different pieces of this puzzle, which then creates um, uh, not a great uh, lived experience for the communities. I think now with DTSC having their public participation officers, seems like there's four on the ground. Uh, I, my question to us is, can we use the, the PPOs to provide a more holistic solution um, for the communities? Three examples of things that they might consider doing. Uh, one is we talked about the light paint cleanup uh, uh, solutions available from the local counties, so providing that. Uh, the, the conversation yesterday with the PPOs, we heard about 
uh, non-maintenance questions being asked by residents and how maybe PPOs are having to provide weed killer solutions. So how can we use what is available through the Safer uh, Consumer Products Program to then advise the residents on how they can safely take care of their lawns? And then thirdly, we also heard about some residents wanting to get maybe bio biomonitoring done for their own um, health and protection. So perhaps providing that as a, as a leave behind for the residents uh, once the cleanup is done. Clearly an ongoing conversation. There's more for us to do here. Thank you. So um, thank you for that. And thank you for the the just recognizing the just the complexities, the multiple layers to this. Um, you know, our public participation specialists, <laughs> they do have their hands full. So I'm not going to sit here and sign them up <laughs> for additional obligations that um, um, we do keep our eye on the prize, which is there's lead contamination there. And that's our top priority is remediating that lead, lead, uh, lead contamination. But, sorry, but, um, but taking that step back and looking for the opportunities to see if there are other things we can bring to the conversation is warranted. I will say that, for instance, safer consumer products, we have no jurisdiction over pesticides, right? So then that would mean we'd turn to our, it is an intersectional issue. Lawns in this day and drought are challenging in and of themselves, you know. And then if we want to bring in the Department of Pesticides in to talk about integrated pest management approaches, it gets very complicated very fast. And that said, you know, this concept of one-stop shopping for a resident, it's like government is government. You're government. So why aren't why isn't all of government here? There's no easy answer, but we have to keep looking for solutions. And that's where when Francesca talks about how do we operationalize this and having a conversation with Swati about that and what that looks like, that's what we have to roll up our sleeves on and, and give some thought to. Thank you. So uh, when I was shuffling the cards, I missed one of our commenters. Um, who uh, who signed up to make a comment on the Exide update specifically. So can we acknowledge her at this yes, time? Yes, of course. Uh, Angela Johnson Maceros, if you would please come to the podium. Um, if you will state your name and any affiliation for the record, as well as you'll have two minutes to make your comment. Great. Thank you. I'm Angela Johnson Mazaros with Earth Justice. And um, I had two things that I wanted to say. First, um, I, when I first heard that this was going to be explored as a super fun it's site. It's a little hard to hear you, Angela. Can you? Thank you. So two things I wanted to say. First, when I first heard that this was going to be considered as a super fun site, I shared Cynthia Babbage's reaction, which was yikes. So I've been, um, I have many years of experience working with that community, um, the Montrose community on that cleanup. And I just want to highlight two things. First, um, Having something listed as a Superfund site is not necessarily an answer, certainly not to the kinds of things that you've been hearing from folks here. And, um, and it's not clear what will happen as this process goes forward. So the announcement sounds very exciting, and yet the work, be, the work ahead is still immense. Um, they have a cleanup remedy in Delamo that's going to be t like 2,700 years to clean up the water, groundwater, for example. So people should not see this as, yay, finally, but I'll, it's just one additional piece. And I just wanted to raise that so that to help with setting expectations. The second thing I want to say is, in this notion of continuous improvement in DTSC, as you are embarking on this conversation, as you're embarking on this conversation about how to deal with Exide, I just have to raise the fact that there is a second secondary lead smelter in this area. Quameco is the facility, and it has been smelting lead in Southern California for 60 years. 30 seconds. You are, um, we have, we have um, serious concerns that Quameco is the next Exide, and we are urging DTSC to act now instead of finding you yourselves in a parallel situation at some point in the future. After 60 years of operations, the community is impacted by those emissions and they need to be addressed sooner rather than later. Thank you so much for your comment. 
Okay, thank you. That would fall under the comments um, of items not on the agenda, but thank you for it, uh, where you placed it. Thank you. Uh, how are we? We're going to move some things around because we know you're all here and you um, are interested in commenting. We want to talk about the tour sites. How much time do we have before we have to break? We have 15 minutes before we absolutely have to uh, break some of um, our employees. So um, however you want to do that. We I think need we, so, should, we should get started. Yeah, let's get, I just... We had anticipated about an hour and a half for workshopping and having open dialogue with um, community members, community organizations that we met with yesterday, as well as report backs from each board member. And I want to um, honor everybody that's here in person and be um, aware of the time commitments that you all may have. So I think let's spend the next 15, maybe 20 minutes on hearing 15 minutes on hearing comments from those um, folks that are here, and then we will continue this after lunch as well. But we want to be respectful for all the staff that has been here since early in the morning and to be able to give them a break as well. So let's get started with the next agenda item. So it'll continue after lunch as well. Right. Okay. So um, again, to the, go, um, can you go to four? To those folks who have joined us on the phone, um, if you press star one, you can join the queue. And star two um, is to um, take your comment out. And then Valerie or Michelle, uh, whichever one of you is on the operator for this time, we had a commenter before um, who wanted to comment on this item. Again, we're um, I believe it was Janice. So Michelle or um, Valerie. Can you allow that commenter to? Jenny Hi. Mack, your line is open. Hi, um, you will have two minutes to express your comment and um, can we, we can take this commenter, but can we get comments from people that are here in person because they may not be here after lunch? Um, if you can please uh, go ahead and express your comment. You have two minutes um, to express your comment. Please state your name and affiliation. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. Your line is open. Please check your mute button. Hi, uh, my name is Jenny Mack. I'm with Parents Against SSFL. I was on one of the tours yesterday with Director Williams and board members Rizzo and Louie. And I have to say that I benefited, as I believe many of the other group members did, immensely from the tour. And I felt that that experience helped elevate the dialogue between the community members and DTSC and the new board members, I'm looking forward to having future experiences with the additional board members that I haven't yet had the pleasure of meeting. Um, I feel very strongly that this is the way to go. Um, I want to touch on a couple of things I didn't have time to yesterday, which is um, the settlement agreement and the resident pathway with the garden, as Director Williams mentioned earlier today, is what the community wants. However, the new residential standard in the settlement agreement, after being adjusted more closely, resembles the old recreator standard, which, so essentially, this garden pathway with, sorry, residential pathway with garden, it is what we want, but it has been redefined to be far less stringent and much weaker. And um, that's why it's so important um, when we ha when we submitted our action items, um, we we really want BES to hold a special oversight session, scrutinizing um, the deal that's been reached. Um, and again, I'd like to reiterate for all the board members to hear that the thirty seconds ask is that the format of the presentations by Director Williams defending DTSC's actions and by Daniel Hirsch, the former director of the Program on Environmental and Nuclear Policy at UC Santa Cruz, 
longtime expert on the SSFL, provide the substance of the criticism of the deal. So we would like to be able to lay it all out and let Williams and Hirsch really crunch those numbers, show them to you so that we know that we're, what we're looking at so that you understand what the community is going to be getting um, if that settlement agreement is enacted, if, it, if the MOU is approved. Um, but again, I'd like to finish on a positive note, which is I thought yesterday was great. I appreciate everyone taking the time. I look forward to more of the same. Um, but we really would like a, a session to go over the settlement agreement data. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. It was quite an amazing uh, day yesterday, um, and we'll uh, we'll be following up on that. We know that there's um, different interpretations that we need to reconcile, so we will be doing that. Thank you. Next comment. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have two comment cards from um, those who joined us in person. Um, if you would like to comment now on the site visits, if um, I would start with Cruz Becerra. No? Um, Husafe Mohammed Imam Udin. Okay. What was that? Uh, we, ha we have about five minutes if you... We're, we're okay. Go ahead. Okay, come on. Yeah, I, w I wasn't available yesterday. Um, I'm technically not available right now. My daughters are like, "Yo, we haven't finished packing, so I need to, I need to leave." Um, mid August, after mid August, I'll be more available. So I'm definitely down to meet with y'all, go through all this stuff, all the questions y'all are asking. I'm like, we've been having those answers, right? We've been having those conversations. Um, because many of us have been part of this process much longer than than some of the DTSC staff who are now doing this stuff, right? And so we're able to bring back those memories of those conversations had and what the rationale was at different points. Um, and so, yeah, I look forward to connecting with y'all in, in the future. And same here. Thank you. So we've got a few more minutes. If there's um, anyone else from, okay. Please just state your name and affiliation um, yes. for the record. Uh, Pete Reyes, uh, with a member of East Yards, and I'm also a work part workforce participant with the Insight Project. I just want to turn in the pictures. I will email all the information because I don't have time. Just to, I was talking to Mark right now and just mentioning that real quick. Um, I think it's very important for you to acknowledge that um, this is my free time, right? This is my work time. I came from work. My daughter's in the hospital. She just got a heart transplant. Okay. I could have been with her instead of here, but I'm just putting this extra effort because I think it's necessary to voice this. Um, but I think it's just very important to acknowledge because it's very simple for Medi or Meredith or DTSC to just say, let's meet, let's meet, let's meet. But at the same time, it's like, we can't just be doing this pro bono. At some point, it needs to be acknowledged that there's a lot of effort put into this. Um, and with that said, I just want to turn this in. Thank, Thank you for you. your time. I appreciate the committee. And again, I, I really... Um, I can't thank you enough for creating this space. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, you probably have those electronically as well, correct? Yes. I will and it might be, that email. might be useful to yes. also email them and then they can be shared um, more readily. But thank you for that. Oh, I will do that. I will follow up with detailed information to that email. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh, we have one more. Uh, we have time for maybe one more comment, if there are any. Otherwise, um, I would recommend that we break for lunch. Right. The, so this was any, any comment from any of you who were on any of the tours yesterday um, that want to talk about it? If not, we'll go to board member experiences. No, we won't go to board member experiences until after lunch. So um, in respect for... Um, Worker comfort and safety, we're going to take a break so that uh, people can get some lunch. And we will return here at five minutes to two. No more than an hour. We're going to start. Prompting. So one, 150. Oh, how about what? 150. Just 150. Let's do just 150. Just give, give everybody an hour. Yeah. Let's, because yes. one hour. It's Thank an hour. You. We are now breaking for lunch. Uh, we'll be returning at 150. Um, so please enjoy your time.
All right, we're here. Okay, I want to welcome everybody back to the Board of Environmental Safety meeting. Um, the time is 1.55 and uh, quorum is maintained with uh, Member, Ru Member Ruiz, Chair Rizzo, Member Strauss-Hacker, Member Batia, and Member Gomez. Um, so right now we are going to jump straight into a comment from one of our community members who was waiting so patiently um, and who was unable to get into the queue at the time. So um, Michelle, if you would allow um, Rabina Soul's line to uh, be opened and then also um, Rabina, you will have two minutes to make your comment and please state your name and affiliation for the record. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. My name is Rabina Sewell. I'm the Executive Director of California Safe Schools, where uh, Children's Environmental Health and Environmental Justice Coalition, and we're located here in Los Angeles, Southern California. We wish the board only the best moving forward and so greatly appreciate members of the board visiting with EJ communities and schools in Southern California. And we hope that these very important visits can continue throughout the state. And just for a clarification, and I know it wasn't intentional, the agenda notes Fremont High School. Um, actually, the sites and concerns um, and comments uh, expressed yesterday actually surrounded Fremont Elementary School, which is part of Long Beach Unified School District, uh, not Fremont High School. Uh, concerns um, stated, I'm just going to be very brief, uh, included but were not limited to concerns about the raw, the lack of the site characterization, testing protocols, and especially um, this was very important to the folks. The references made in the raw to San Bernardino. Again, Fremont Elementary site is located in Long Beach, California, nowhere near San Bernardino. Um, finally, the last comment I really want to make is surrounding DTSC webcasts. 30 seconds. The way that they are being promoted now do not provide an open platform for transparent communication. There's no chat. There's no knowledge of the participants on the website. And we sincerely hope that future DTSC webcasts can promote an open platform that provides transparency and really shows a true desire for two-way uh, communication. I want to thank you all again for your service and feel free to reach out to us anytime if we can assist you in any way. Thank you and all the best. <clears throat> thank you very much. Uh, we appreciate that and appreciate that you made the time yesterday. So um, thank you for your comments. And uh, I assume you've directed uh, directly to DTSC about their meetings, uh, but we'll make sure that we do. Thank you. No, she said DTSC. Okay. Uh, Madam Chair, would you like to move into agenda item five? Yes, I would like to move into agenda item five, which is also uh, agenda item six and also part of agenda item 13, if you're keeping track. Because the, the <laughs> we obviously had to move things around this morning. The Exide section went a lot longer than anticipated, but all very important and valuable information. So we, we're continuing with the discussion about the board visits, the three distinct separate board <coughs> visits yesterday to different sites and meetings with community groups, as well as community feedback on those meetings. So what we'll do now, we had some community feedback earlier, um, and we'll, we'll certainly allow for that um, after we hear from the board members and their experience of being on these tours. So we'll ask each board member to discuss where they went, who they met with, what their impressions were, how it affected their thinking, um, what they came away with, or whatever other elements you want to report um, out on. The reason that item 13 morphs a little bit into this is because there were 
site changes over the course of the days prior to um, prior to yesterday, and it was too. Uh, we didn't have an opportunity to notice all those on our agenda. So, in the area that is a little more open, called priority areas for board members to report on, it includes those kinds of things. So, Alexis will be reporting on some additional vi uh, community visits and site visits that she made during this section of the report. So, why don't we start with one of the amazing organizers of this, um, Lizette Ruiz, uh, who was so involved with the local community members in, in the um, electric bus tour that we took. And I had the privilege of being on that one. So why don't we hear from you, Lizette? Sure thing. Um, yes, yeah, so our, our tour uh, was a little more extensive and, and we were fortunate enough to uh, take the tour on an electric bus. So we were, you know, um, decreasing our carbon footprint that way. Um, but we started at Cudahy Park, where, um, which is next to an elementary school that was built on top of a, um, a, a, a facility that received a lot of... Uh, really dangerous contamination and um, as, as was done at the time, uh, the, the school was built over it without proper precautions. So throughout the year, students were, um, were exposed to a lot of the contamination that still remained beneath um, the school. And so we had community members, a, a community member and dear friend of mine talk about his experience there and um, also talk about um, uh, they also talked about Exide. We, we did go through uh, Southeast LA onto Exide, met with a resident local to the area who had um, his property, his property re, uh, remediated. Um, and so he talked about his, his experience with that. He, and it, it mostly had to do with dissatisfaction in, in the quality of the work, as, as was expressed earlier today. His dissatisfaction was mostly with um, the, the way the, the yard was uh, left, um, the type of soil that was used, that it wasn't really uh, adequate for, for the type of yard he had, which was, um, he, he, you know, he wanted to have grass as, as he had before that. So... We, by pure chance, while we were there, we ran into another property that was undergoing undergoing remediation. So we were able to witness some of the um, practices that are 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 used through that, and um, it really did bring in more depth to some of the commentaries that were were brought upon us today. And so. Um, we also had the opportunity to go to another school that, that has been put on hold, uh, another proposed school on a contaminated site. And so we were able to meet with um, Cudahy Alliance for Justice. And we were also able to go to a dry cleaner that's using cleaner technologies to um, treat clothing. Um, I, as many of you here know, dry cleaning facilities have been um, a very a big source of pollution for contamination that reaches our groundwater. And so uh, Monica's cleaners down Gage and Figueroa has taken it upon themselves to apply for a grant to buy a wet, wet cleaning dry machine, which um, reduces or the, the use of water and pretty much does a really nice job at, at, at you know, cleaning garments that um, may, may otherwise be cleaned using um, um, so-called green technologies with, with um, petroleum hydrocarbons, which um, many believe is, is not really clean. Um, so uh, we also had an opportunity to have lunch at Mercado de la Paloma. We met with community members there um, who spoke to us about um, different remediation methods. Um, and uh, they also spoke to us about uh, safety for, for workers who might not be protect who are not protected by OSHA. And generally these workers are, are 
people who are contracted directly by by homeowners and so um that was pretty eye opening for me and and it's um it, and it's very unfortunate because a lot of these workers are exposed to a lot of chemicals um, without, and, and a lot of dangers without, like I said before, having the protections of, of OSHA. And um, finally, we were able to go through Lemur Park and meet with community, uh, a small business owner there who is, um, as Jeannie mentioned earlier, is us utilizing, um, trying to use uh, cleaner products, safer products for um, people in his community because he really does take ownership for his his community and, and wants to have the best available product and services for, for his patrons. And um, yeah, that was pretty much what we went through. Um, I don't know if you want to add anything, Jeannie. Well, I think the, uh, a couple of points that I was going to start with, I just want to reassure everyone again. I want to reassure everyone again that though we divided the board into three sections and we did not have any uh, discussions with members about any issues that are pending. Um, and since even though there was a withdrawal of the um, uh, Earth Justice uh, Cometco appeal, we still did not have those conversations. Um, that we hadn't announced it yes, yet at this meeting, so we didn't uh, engage in, in any discussions about matters that are pending before this board. And oh, yeah. now that said, um, there were a couple of things that came up yesterday. I, I It was a very powerful and emotional experience to be with community members. There were probably, I don't know, there was, must have been 30 of us on the, on the bus. Um, and... Right. Yes, and 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 one thing I didn't mention was just the the impact that it had on me. Yeah, if I could add that. Really no, quick. no, that's okay. It you know this 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 is my community. This is where I was born, Southeast LA. I, I was born and raised, and um, it's a community that I've invested my whole life in. I've been a part of communities for a better environment since since I was a kid, um, and so. Being able to go through this tour, not only in my community, but in, in neighboring areas really um, not only gave me hope because of the of the initiative that people are taking upon themselves to to really push um, environmental health and safety on on us to to make really make sure that, you know, that that we understand where they're coming from, that we understand why they do what they do, and to see the possibilities and, and how much work a lot of these community members have put, it, it really um, gave me more uh, more inspiration to really push through and make sure that, and, and really look forward to, to meeting with other communities as well, because it's an environmental justice is something that, that a lot of us you know, have been fighting for for so many years, and it it really does help to see the similarities in a lot of our struggles, and 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 it's it's sad, but it it gives me hope to to really see the passion in a lot of the other uh, community groups that that have been fighting for for their own community, and um and uh, I really want to thank also the, the Parents Against the Santa Susana Field Laboratories because it, it also really brought up um, the, the, the faces that of, the, of the community that even though we weren't able to go there in person, it, it really brought you know, the community to us. That's great. Thank you. Uh, there, were, there were interesting learnings um, that many of you may already know about. One of them are... It just reminded us of how long these things seem to take, how many years or decades community groups have been on this. Um, and I know that that it's not as if DTSC and Cal EPA aren't, but the suffering communities have been enduring these things and fighting for these things for so long. We talked about everything from um, when Delta Air did a fuel dump at 2,000 feet instead of 8,000 feet and the impact that it had on communities and the remediation that is still not complete from something like that. Uh, we talked about... Um, how difficult it is to notify community members when they're renters. And so if communication is sent to homeowners, uh, 
the renters don't get that. They're not getting that information in the same way. And some homeowners or apartment owners or, you know, people that rent out their either single family duplex or multiplex uh, housing don't necessarily pass that on. So how do we do that? How do we get to the residents? Because they're the ones who are enduring the cleanup, enduring the um, toxic exposure. And there's re reluctance on the part of landlords to get involved in this. One, it looks bad when their house is being dug up. They're concerned about property values, right? There's a whole lot of things. So how do we create a communication strategy around that that, that I would say, forces them to consider the health and well-being of the people who are renting their properties and um, and also bear in mind their concerns around um, this not just, I mean, there's ways to frame these things. They don't have to just be remedi remediation of a horrible toxic site. They can be the restoration. And, you know, there's ways to think about this that we haven't been doing. And I think that came out pretty loud and clear um, for us in the community meetings, that, that it's a positive uh, outcome for them to be able to say that their property is clean. and But there's resistance. And some of them don't even live locally or even live in California. So understanding the relationship between uh, property owner and tenant, since many, many of these properties are, are renters. So, and, and often Spanish speaking only. And so if the notices come to the residents in English um, or if they're just translated, that's not good enough. We need to have more on the ground connection um, with the people who live in, in those residences. So that came out um, really loud and clear. That was one of the uh, and also the the labor um, issue. What's not under OSHA? right? How day workers are not protected. Uh, domestic workers are not protected. So it's really difficult to think about how to protect the people working in these areas when there is not a government agency ensuring their protection. So we had a lot of discussions about things like that. Um, the KIPP school site was probably um, one of the most dramatic to, to look at and to hear from the people who've been working on that. It's stalled right now, as it should be. Uh, but, but the city council wants to give them the permit to build on this toxic site, and the community members have, um, have fought that and, and received a ruling that shuts it down, but everybody's concerned about what's the next legal step and are we going to get to the point where either KIPP remediates this site or abandons this site or what happens. But it's right across from a community center, right near a school, right near residences, so, and it's horribly toxic site. Pardon? And industrial to the back. Yes, exactly. So there were, I think it really helped us to feel it, to um, be present. And I know, as, as we've said before, we want to do a lot more of that. Um, and, and there's pieces of legislation that uh, we'll be paying attention to as well and be seeking legal counsel here as to what we can weigh in on and probably weighing in anyway on it and having you tell us what we did. No, um, there is legislation and we invited community groups to let us know about legislation that they're supporting or interested in and we certainly want to hear from others so that we can be attentive to legislative issues that will come be, you know, we don't want to not be paying attention. And so that, I think, is an area of work for us. And we've talked in the past about the fact that our remit um, organizational chart, if you will, our staffing allocations um, don't include uh, policy um, per se. And uh, so there are areas that we feel we ought to be attentive to that we may or may not be fully staffed uh, in the way that we would like to be, uh, but we will be keeping those things in mind as we go forward and as we speak with the legislature about how we can be the most effective, what tools we use, what resources we have. We do have resources from uh, DTSC teams, and we also need some that are independent of that. And that includes um, issues like communications. Our community outreach will be 
vastly expanded directly by our, uh, when we hire our office of ombuds. So that'll be part of the mandate for that group. Um, we also talked about how health is included in, in, um, in any of the permitting decisions. Uh, everyone was very, very concerned that public health, the long-term cumulative impact, the multiple exposures, because these communities are not just exposed to the today issue. They also have all the other exposures, the cumulative and multiple exposures of living in communities that are vastly contaminated. So we spent quite a bit of time on that. So it wasn't just the lived experience that we were interested in hearing about, it was also the working experience. And we heard quite a bit about that on our tour as well. And that really expanded the thinking, not just to your residents, but to where you go to work. So if we're not remediating the commercial sites and that's where the people are going to work, then maybe their front yard got cleaned up, but their place of business or the place that they go to work did not. So we have those kinds of things. Uh, also, we did note in one of the cleanup sites that we happened to watch happening that not all the workers were, um, were masked. And there they were digging up gravel and, and there was dust spewing from it. And so we observed that directly and I know we'll be reporting that out on the location of that site um, to DTSC team. And so, um, let's see, uh, we talked about the um, language justice issue and I know we've struggled here and really want some more input. Um, we're sad that there are fewer Spanish-speaking people that call in or attend our meetings. What are we, how are we going to do better at that? How is the whole department going to do better and how are we? Because that's part of our mandate. We have interpreter services. We'll be hearing more from Swathi as we contract for that going forward. We're absolutely committed to it and we want the recipients of that to have the opportunity, the knowledge that we're here for that and make it a meaningful experience. So it may just be that the traditional way of doing interpretation and providing a phone line may not be the most effective way to do this. There may be some additional work that we need to do in advance of meetings to do outreach to um, non-English speaking communities and engage them um, to be able to participate in these meetings. So that felt important to us. Um, we talked, um, it was primarily environmental justice groups on the ground, as was noted by Lisette, the um, Parents Against Santa Susana Field Lab did come. And I think it was, um, as you heard, uh, you may have heard the comment before lunch from one of the members of that group, that while they have their body of concerns that are very specific to um, one calculation within the agreement, they also felt really positively uh, engaged with, with not just us, but seeing that they have brothers and sisters in community, that it's not limited to their geography. And I think that that was a great experience for them and for all of us, that, um, you know, as bad as this is, that's also, and this could be good. So there was um, a lot of dialogue. It was, um, a very uh, positive experience, um, disheartening and heartening at the same time. And I know that we'll be doing more of these uh, when we get to the part of the agenda to talk, talk about the geography. We have Central Valley, we have East and North Bay, we have parts of the state that we also want to visit and we also want to come back to areas that we've touched that we don't want to just uh, touch and lift off. So how do we do that? How do we sustain what we um, what we set in motion here? And then how do we expand it? So uh, that includes, I've now um, covered two items in the agenda, um, Liz and myself reporting out on our touring, unless you had something to add to yours, Liz? No, just the same, but I really do look forward to. This on. I really do look forward to seeing how we can, you know, grow from this and, and also figure out how to expand it throughout the state. That's great. Uh, Georgette, would you, um, okay, so sh okay, yes. you're going. Okay. okay, I'll go. And then Georgette, you'll add. Okay, okay. wonderful. Uh, so first I want to start by saying 
a huge thank you to all the organizers that helped us uh, get our tour ready today. Thank you, Swati, all the folks at DTSC, and also the community organizations we met with yesterday. Um, it was a really powerful day for us to learn the context in which we are all operating, both from a geographic perspective, a cultural perspective, and also the emotional perspective. Um, we, being um, member Georgette Gomez and I, toured the Exide facility. We were able to see all the neighborhoods surrounding Exide, drive through all the residences. Uh, we also visited the Vivian Wood and the Estrada properties that came up in the in our public comment earlier today. Uh, and later in the day, we had some meetings with community organizations that we'll talk about later. Uh, so in terms of the learnings and the opportunities, uh, there's um, a five-page memo out to Jean that talks about the wealth of information we gathered yesterday. Uh, but to summarize a few things, uh, one is that surrounding the Excite facility, there are other confounding factors that impact the residents and the community in general. So there's a new rendering plant, there's a railroad there. So from a noise and smell perspective, there's all of these other factors that make the, the community's experience further more negative and more impacted. Uh, so that was new for me. Uh, other things we learned was um, this is one of the largest cleanups in the nation. So, so given that, this is a huge uh, Herculean effort that uh, the state is undertaking to do the cleanup within the 1.7 square mile radius. So just getting a sense of the magnitude of the, of the cleanup, um, I think that really impacted me. Uh, we were able to see some residences that were cleaned up and then some that were in the process of being, being cleaned up. Um, and largely what we, what we got away, walked away with was an understanding of what cleanup actually looks like. So what cleanup looks like is movement or soil excavation of like 12 to 18 inches depth of soil being moved out uh, of the land and then filled with clean fill and then landscaped and returned back to the homeowners. So in this process, there's a lot of uh, sort of hand holding that needs to get done to make sure the, the residents feel like they're being supported and their their home is being restored to what to their expectations. Um, we, I think the other thing we, we got away from this is um, from a numbers perspective, it seems like DTSC is cleaning up as planned, and the number of sort of uh, complaints coming in is uh, under 5%. But that's different from what we sort of heard today, which is that numbers don't tell us the full story. Uh, there are many opportunities that we've taken away from the conversations yesterday and the public comment today. I won't go over all of them, but I'll just I'll cover a few things. And I'm really framing these as the, as the how might we questions because there's opportunities for DTSC, us as the board, the community organizations to work together to, to serve the community. So, so really the first potential opportunity is um, how might we convince the holder properties, uh, these are property managers that haven't signed up for the cleanup, to sign up for cleanup. So how do we get to do that? So we can accelerate the pace of cleanup. Um, how might we and the community organizations ensure that the, the old Exide facility, which is now going to get sold and repurposed, how might we repurpose it to make sure the community's needs are met and how can we stay engaged? Um, how might we ensure that the communities are supported post cleanup with the right set of resources? That's another uh, topic we heard about during the public comment phase. Also, how might we engage with OEHA's biomonitoring program to track community burdens? Because we talked about how there's confounding factors potentially at play here. Um, we heard a lot about data transparency today. It came up yesterday as well, where there's a lot of dashboards and a lot of data being shared, and somehow that data is either not being consumed or not being presented in a consumable fashion for the communities. So how might we report the relevant information and make sure the communities have it? Um, Another big theme we heard today, which also came up yesterday, was how can we use the, the, the contracting process and the payment process to hold uh, the contractors accountable to higher workplace standards. So the, all of these are opportunities, and there's a lot more in our, in our broader report. Uh, I'm going to pause here. Georgette, do you have anything to add? 
Thank you. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I, I too had an opportunity to partner with Shusma and uh, in partial DTSC staff. Um, I also want to express the gratitude for everybody that was involved in putting that together. Um, in addition to just, I'm just going to add, I, I don't want to repeat just in courtesy of time, but I think we are recognizing that this is the biggest um, cleanup areas that we have in the whole state. I think it's very significant. And, and I think there's over the times, I think staff has learned best practices. And one of the learning uh, as we're engaging in the cleanup is, you know, doing um, before uh, the cleanups were being done in, in various different locations, right? Either one home here and another home over here. I think the new approach is trying to take on block by block, and that's helping staff to move faster and more efficient. And I think this is one of the things that I believe the organizations, um, specifically in North East Yard, um, mentioned that they were trying to push that idea early on, and I think there was resistance, but I think now we've learned that it's something that does, is helping the efficiency side of things, which now staff is approaching the cleanup in such a way, which I think is great. The other one is what I've learned, and I think this is something that I'm more interested in digging a little bit more is the cleanup is also incorporating, part of the agreement was to create a work, for, a, a work program uh, where I think we heard it actually today, some of the comments from the public who are residents. Um, so the cleanup has actually, uh, DTSC has created a program where residents that are from the community can go through this program to be part of the cleanup crew. Closer or further? Close. Closer or further? Okay. Big part of the cleanup crew. Um, and they go through a certification process. Um, and I think it's it's something that has created an opportunity for residents that have been impacted to get a better opportunity for a better job. Um, and after the cleanup, they've been, um, if they're not part of the program anymore, they can actually go into the trades so it's something that is actually part of uh, doing a local local hire component for the ag site cleanup, and I thought it was really great, and it's something that we can learn from to insert into future cleanups as we move forward. Um, and then the other piece that we've learned, and I think um, I, I brought it up in some of the questions, one is the desire to expand the cleanup area, right, uh, which I know that it's a future discussion. Um, but also within that, and I know we heard it from staff, but I would love to continue exploding, ex, ex, exploring the opportunities is um, being able to expand the cleanup areas outside of just the soil. There is internal dust that goes into attics and crawl spaces that are currently not being touched because uh, that was a decision being made. Um, and I know that we heard from um, some community members that they would want to expand that, uh, which because it is part of you know people's realities, right? Um, and um, what else? I think that's that's to the extent that I'll add. I think uh, there's great learning um, opportunities that that has taken. Um, f um, part of, and hopefully those learning techniques can help us expand the the how we approach cleanups overall. Um, I think uh, community participation, and one thing that I took from here is perhaps something down the line, being that Exide is is such a huge cleanup effort, and there's a lot that has been going on, uh, new ways, new approaches. I think it might be helpful to down the line maybe have, a, I think there was a request to have a specific, either a full board or partial board, but a community workshop to just focus on the actual cleanup, what's occurred, what are the new techniques that are being incorporated, um, and how are we proceeding further. So I think um, there is an opportunity to, and perhaps even have it in the evening as well, if we do want to do that, but I think um, that's one thing that I took away as well. That's great, and I think one opportunity or one place, and I'm sure there are many more, um, as the hazardous waste plan is in process of being 
discussed, designed, and rolled out next year, and we're participants in that, <clears throat> that, that we ensure the, this element is part of hazardous waste planning. So um, I think there are at least one or two, and all of us will be interested in that, but uh, to hold that as a real priority for that process. And, it, and it, it will be a public process, so we do invite the community to participate in this and, and, and really bring your ideas on what to do with this, ha with the hazardous waste. Right. Thank you. Um, th I just want to take the opportunity to also thank the community. <laughs> Uh, I want to thank the community members we met with yesterday. I want to call out Laura from um, East Yards. We met her yesterday. I want to thank her for being so authentic and for having such a candid conversation with us about what we can do better. Uh, also, I want to thank um, Assembly Member Miguel Santiago's office, uh, Crystal and Matt, and also former staffer Giselle. I think generally from all of them, the, there are a lot of wisdom that we gain from them and a lot of things we can do differently, but also what became abundantly clear is that DTSC and the community organizations are in between the community and the contractors, and the, the tighter the cohesion is between these community organizations and DTSC, the better we can collectively serve the communities. Thank you both. Um, Alexis, will you uh, talk about what you did yesterday and then we'll hear from Swathi and move into, because you, you, oh, you toured okay. around as well. Yes. Yes. Okay. I, I took three uh, separate tours yesterday. I was joined by Ivana Tavras, the... Uh, Sorry, excuse me. I took three tours yesterday. I was joined by Ivana Cazares, Office of Environmental Equity, by Larry Haffitz, the DTSC Chief Counsel. Um, and the first place we visited was a downtown day laborers site. And so we were hosted in downtown LA in the Garment District by the Instituto de la Educación Popular del Sur de California, which I'll call IDEPSCA. And I want to thank both Nancy, oh, excuse me, Megan Ortiz and Nancy Zudniga, um, who were very attentive and showed us so many facets of their operation. Their clients encounter many unknowns in such varied workplace conditions. They may be sent to an old warehouse or to a property after a fire. And Adepska works with the Department of Public Health on conveying best practices for personal protection. Um, they work with EPA on lead paint abatement certification training and many other departments. And through this lens, I thought, what do we as a Board of Environmental Safety do um, with regard to this whole category in our economics stratum of, of day laborers, which other board members have mentioned um, earlier today? And I think going forward, opportunities really abound with DTSC and others to be able to communicate bilingually on chemical exposure and how to use the California Cleaning Product Right to Know Act, which is also called SP 258. And um, as Ivana had suggested yesterday, to try and reach to neighborhood councils and households through things like Nextdoor and the like um, with this kind of information. And I brought back from their storefront um, a very recent publication they put out for their clients, all in Spanish, produced by the National, in concert with the National Institute of Health, of things that you would need to know in an emergency. And it's a really helpful kind of thing that their clients, after their registration, um, can take away with them. So I thought that was a great example of what can be done. I'm going to take up Jeannie's offer to combine um, our three different agenda items <laughs> that had to do with where we went <clears throat> yesterday. And I will, um, with Swathi, I mentioned that Swathi, Ivana, Larry, and I met with community leaders, uh, Robina Suol, Cynthia Babich, Andrea Wader, Rebecca Overmeyer Velasquez, Duncan McKee, and Angela Johnson Mizaris, each of whom has given years of dedication to understanding and resolving site contamination issues in their respective communities. And I personally thank them for the insight and knowledge they shared with us yesterday. The histories that they recounted reinforce for me the importance of a community's concerns being heard 
and of government <coughs> agencies, as is our chairs want to express government agencies being accountable, transparent, and willing to engage. At contaminated sites, as sampling analysis and decision-making proceeds, trusting relationships can begin to build. Communities do want direct, regular, and frank conversations with government agencies responsible for addressing contaminated sites, responsible for permitting and compliance evaluations of operating facilities. They want direct conversations with managers and technical staff. That was so clearly conveyed. We discussed, as had been mentioned earlier today, the challenge of incorporating cumulative impacts and facilities operating histories per SB 673 into the permitting and compliance responsibilities of government agencies, including DTSC. And lastly, to try and uh, encapsulate what well, was a much more detailed and rich conversation, we were asked to bring a greater sense of urgency as we focus on the most critical threats. The third part of my tour in the afternoon was hosted by the Los Angeles Unified School District. And I thank Carlos Torres, who is the Director of Environmental Health and Safety, and his colleague, Jonathan Keflin, who were generous with their time in showing us three school sites the Del Amo Elementary School, Jordan High School, and the 28th Street Elementary School. Each in its own way was illustrative of the issue of when you have schools and residences directly affected by long-standing industrial operations next door. Our land use practices of 50 years ago don't serve our children well at these and many other school campuses in my view. But what can we do? In the short term, we can be rigorous in ensuring that such facilities operate in full unambiguous compliance with federal, state, and local requirements. And in the longer term, I'm confident that we can work with these businesses and properties to operate in more compatible locations. There's much more to the conversation, but thank you, Madam Chair. It was a, a rich and wonderful day. Thank you, Alexis. Um, and Swathi um, also joined uh, various tours all day. I'll let her explain her yo-yo day. Uh, <laughs> sure. So I had the benefit of joining all three tours, um, which was wonderful. And uh, I'll, I'll just say on a personal note that this is why I, I joined this position and this board is to connect with community. It's always been so important in all of the work that I've always done. Um, and it was just so impactful. It is, it's, it's different having like a Zoom meeting or one-on-one -on -one meeting or being out in the community meeting actual community members and hearing their lived experiences and their stories and just how much that impacts the, the work that we do. Because unless we see it with our own eyes, we can't live their experiences, but until we meet with them and hear their stories, it's it's just like I think somebody mentioned earlier, it's just a, a checklist on, on a spreadsheet and just how important it is for us to continue to do these types of meetings. And as um, board Chair Rizzo has mentioned that we will be visiting many communities. This was just one, this was just a, a corner of Los Angeles, right? This was just a small piece of it, but this is something that I hope we can continue to, um, to do. Um, so before we invite uh, community groups to, um, to, to also comment um, on yesterday's tours, I did want to take a moment and just thank everybody that we met with. I would love to mention each individual person, but I'm going to name the organizations. It really was uh, quite an undertaking of three separate tours that had three different agenda items and different organizations, different sites, and there and it couldn't have been possible without um, all of these organizations. So I would personally like to thank um, Change Coalition, Communities for a Better Environment, 
and um, Physicians for Social Responsibility, um, Los Angeles. The tour that Jeannie and Liz went on was just, it was just incredible. I would also like to thank the following organizations, um, Black Women for Wellness, California Safe Schools, um, the Day Labor site that Alexis went to, Del Amo Action Committee, California Environmental Justice Alliance, SEHA, Center for Community Actions and Environmental Justice, um, Kudahe Alliance for Justice, Center for Creative Land Recycling, uh, the PTA of Long Beach Unified School District, Clean Air Coalition of North Whittier and Avocado Heights, um, the Passport Foundation, uh, Dr. Peter Sunshimer and Hans Kim, who are professional wet cleaning experts, um, East Yards Communities for Environmental Justice, Esperanza Community Housing, Instituto de la Educación Popular del Sur de California, IDESPA, uh, Los Angeles Unified School District, and the sites um, that they um, had Alexis tour, which um, she mentioned 28th Street Elementary, School and Jordan High School. Um, Monica's Cleaners, uh, the representatives from Assemblymember Miguel Santiago's office, representatives from City of Commerce, Parents Against Santa Susana Field Laboratory, uh, Earth Justice, South Coast AQMD, and uh, May Salon. I think I covered anybody and please forgive me if I missed anyone, but it, as, as you can see, the board members as well as DTSC staff had a very full and fruitful um, day yesterday. And, I, do you yeah. want to talk about the DTSC people who joined? Uh, yes, I think Meredith uh, mentioned them earlier, but um, uh, Yovana Caceres um, and uh, Diana Ballesteros and um, Larry and Medi. And, I, and, and then there's all obviously the DTSC staff that helped to make this happen too, which we will thank everybody at the end as well. Um, but those were the DTSC staff that had joined us um, on the meeting. We would also, at this moment, love to hear from community groups who joined us yesterday and all the public members that also joined. And Jessica will now provide instructions how everybody can join and comment if they would like. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, so, as you can see on your screen, we have the how to make a comment um, Posted. So, for those of us, for those of you joining in person, if you would please complete a comment card for each comment that you would like, each agenda item that you would like to comment on. Um, if you have joined by phone, um, please press star one to join the queue. Um, so, if and then after you join the queue, please state your name and affiliation at the prompt. Um, if you would like to withdraw your comment at any time, you can put press star two. And if you would like to express your comment only in writing, please give us an email at besinfo at bes.dtsc.ca.gov. Um, so if there is anyone who has joined us in person, um, we don't have any comment cards for this specific item, but if anybody um, has joined us in person, person and would like to make a comment, um, you can raise your hand at this time. Um, so just so you guys know, there is a 20 second delay in the webcast. So um, we may want to just give it a little bit of time for folks to, um, to hear that and dial star one. Um, we, but otherwise, yeah. sure. And I think we heard from a lot of people this morning. Um, it morphed into the uh, Exide update and DTSC report update. But uh, let's see. Yes, I realize that now. Thank you. I was hopeful.
So um, I'm not seeing anyone in queue. I've said the um, my spiel came up on the webcast, so I think we can move to the next Great. agenda item, Madam Great. Chair. Great, thank you. Uh, before we do that, are there any um, lingering comments that any of you thought of since we have no further public comments now? Anything, any board members? I think we identified a few key areas that we will queue up for. Um, yes, we do have one comment, but we will queue up uh, issues that have come up today, uh, and some of them will become part of our standing agenda, part of our priority area reports. Um, before we go to the public comment, um, Sushma, you have something? I, I learned a lot from the tour yesterday and also from hearing the readout from the rest of the board members. Uh, is there, will there be an opportunity for us to share the more detailed readouts with each other through Swati? So what, what the question really goes to, as you know, um, unless we're here all together, this is the place where we get to hear everything. But if board members write up a, a full report of their um, of what they accomplished, can they share? Can we share it with each other? How how does that work, Greg? Can I put? Can I put? We're it putting in the notes? Greg on. Um, okay, um, he said I can put it in the notes. Can put it in the notes. Okay, great. Okay. So it'd be a public item. Okay. Right. So, so it would if be you, public. If you want to, if you want to write your report, then write it knowing it will be public. Right. So no, no, like cryptic little abbreviations and. Uh, whatever. Okay. So Thank you. The, the deadline uh, to get it into uh, the meeting minutes would be, I'd say, two weeks before the next meeting. Okay. So that it can be translated and incorporated into the meeting minutes. Okay. We'll uh, we'll work on that timeline. Swathi will reaffirm the the uh, the timeline for that. Okay. I don't like using the term deadline, by the way. But anyway, uh, we have somebody on the phone. Sushma has a quick question. Uh, it's a, a follow-up comment that in our previous board meetings, we talked about transparency and accountability as our guiding, guiding principles. And I think this is one way we could start to role model that, where we can be transparent with each other and share out the full reports with each other. Uh, and also, it's a part of meeting hygiene and setting that um, as a way to drive transparency. Thank you. Okay, in the service of meeting hygiene, we will um, all prepare our notes and thank you for that recommendation. Okay, here we go. Um, Michelle, um, if you would allow the public member the opportunity to, um, to unmute. Thank you, Cynthia Babbitt, you may go ahead. Um, Ms. Babbitt. Hi again. Just Cynthia right. Babbage, the Lama Action Committee, LAEJ Network Coordinator. Um, I, I just want to say that I, I've been engaging with DTSC for a long time, as you know, and um, I really don't want to get too optimistic because it makes me nervous that some bad re repercussion is going to happen down the road. But I really feel like this is the beginning of rebuilding um, of the relationships that communities need to have with DTSC and this board, and that I have really felt there was genuine engagement yesterday from the site visits and hope that as you guys, you know, busily try and, you know, get your own agenda set and get a handle on all the tasks before you, that there are ways that we can keep more in depth in this conversation about what led us to having a board and some of the pieces that really need to be interwoven in between all the different issues that you're dealing with. And so we keep, you know, letting you know that we're here to help, but um, you know, we just want to make sure that you keep taking us up on that because it is in a spirit of cooperation that we're reaching back out to you. Um, you know, we need things to make a turn for the better and for precaution and, you know, cumulative impacts to rain on decision making. So um, thank you for taking the time to not, you know, make us be invisible and make us visible. Appreciate it. Thank you. I... I I feel like this is um, Liz Reese. Um, I feel like uh, 
something to, to that I'm really taking out of today is is to really keep this communication going with the public, with the community groups we meet with, and and with anybody who's out there throughout the state listening. If if there are any concerns, any comments, um, please feel free to to email us to get a hold of us. Um, we if you if you do send any concerns to our our BES info at bes.dtsc.ca.gov, we will receive those comments and emails and and it'll it'll be something that you know we can stay on top of and 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 at least figure out how to address any comments or concerns so i i really do want to encourage the public to sign up for our our, our emails you know to participate at these meetings because that you know we we do have a lot that we have to do, but we do need the public's help and guidance um, from from all all aspects of the of you know the environmental justice movement from from everywhere along the the state. the The more help, the the better, and and the more inclusive and transparent we can be. Thank you. Um, so, in the spirit of not only transparency, but accountability and follow through. Um, one request that I had received and I would like all of the board members to follow up on is to follow up with everybody that you did meet with yesterday so that it's not a one-way conversation so that they know that you're listening and just following up with them. So that is one thing that before our next board meeting, I would hope that every board member follows up with everybody, all the organizations that you met with yesterday. That's a great assignment, thank you. And I think when there were two first, you can divide up your list um, uh, or, we, or we can do them together, Lizette. So thank you, that's uh, wise. Uh, okay, did you have another comment? No. So we'll now move on to uh, agenda item nine. We're actually, I think, back in order and uh, we will um, actually, yep. nine is 12 or 12 is nine? It, it's nine. Before, before we move on, did any board members have any discussion or questions for each other about yesterday before we move on from that agenda item? At the community meetings yesterday, uh, there were a lot of asks of us and opportunities for us to engage either directly or through DTSC with the community groups. Um, so the, my first ask is when we reach back out to the communities, like let's make sure they feel they feel heard and they feel listened. Let's capture, let's make sure to capture what we heard from them in our communication back to them. And then number two is when we before our next board meeting, since we're going to be able to do. Uh, readouts to each other, more formal readouts. Uh, let's talk about how we can action some of those asks from community members, even if it means that we're not going to be able to follow through on some of them because they fall outside of our purview, just to close the communication loop. That's great. That's great. Great idea. So the format, maybe you can pose a format to all of us, um, Swathi, that also serves your interest uh, in KPIs and, and strategic planning, a format for how we might generate those reports and the questions that we should ask and answer. And that can drive agenda items. Thank you. It, if she could, um, it, Shishma, if you could send that format to Swathi and then Swathi can send it out to the entire board. Yeah. Yeah, that, that would be really helpful because I think it's definitely something that we need to, to discuss what is within our purview, what can we do. Um, I know that, you know, one thing that we do have um, that's one of our mandates is to, to you know, we, we're pretty much um, doing a review of DTSC. So is this something that can be included in that, you know, what, what, how to figure out what their approach has been. Is it thorough enough? Is it not? What can, you know, what can be better? How can it be better? And, um, and, and maybe, you know, is, is there something else that we can look at? Great. Thank you. No, I think we need to. I think this comment, Liz, that you made ties in nicely with our strategic plan discussion, because in the context of strategic plan, we will talk about what 
is in our purview and how do we start to use that lens before we, or in terms of how we choose what we, what activities we take on. But I think this is also a separate point about we're asking community for input, so let's just make sure they're heard and they're acknowledged and that, and that, and that the comments are captured somewhere and that we close the loop with them. This came out loud and clear in our community meetings in that there are many forms for communities to show up and engage, but oftentimes there, maybe there are no recordings of the meetings or there are no meeting notes that clearly capture the actions and the agreements for meetings, which means it's the burden is now on the community to show up every time and to take notes. That's great, thank you. And I think as we as we connect more with the public participation people at DTSC and our own Office of Ombuds, we'll construct uh, a more a flow to this. How do we do this? How do we keep doing it? How do what are they already doing? Where's their duplication? Isn't always bad when it's emphasis, but it can be conflicting if it's not coordinated. So I think. We'll have some of that unpacking to do as well. But this is great. Okay. Uh, you're pointing me to my mic. I know. Okay. Uh, thank you. Now it's we just will hear... the webcast can't hear you if you're. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll hear from Swathi, both, uh, uh, let's see, it's. Um, your, I can, your I can, executive I can say officer report. Yep. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, so I will be reporting back about two items, just a hiring update, um, contract update, as well as budget update. So first off about hiring update. So as you all know that I was hire number one for the board, and I'm excited to announce, well, before I announce that, the, uh, the hire number two, I wanted to take a moment and thank Greg Lyle for your Yes. You light up our life. Yeah. <laughs> I, I hope the camera could catch that. <laughs> Stand up and allow the camera to see. This is a man who has not worn the same tie twice since we met him. He has the biggest collection of ties in the world, but. He doesn't have one that lights up the way he's lit us up for the last several months. So we can't thank you enough for what you've given to us and, uh, and for Larry to uh, putting you on loan to us. We hate to give you back, but thank you. We, we have Greg for about two more weeks, so... You know, it's it's not over yet. <laughs> but thank you. You're, you've just been invaluable, so thank you again. And um, as I mentioned, we do have hire number two, which is the BES board attorney. And um, we're replacing one Greg for another. And so we have hired uh, Greg Forrest. We like our Gregs. Um, Greg Forrest as the BES attorney. And his start date will be July 25th. And he will be hopefully attending the next board meeting um, in August. And in addition to that, um, you know, we have we have a number of uh, positions that we need to fill, and we want to do it with intention. And with um, so we have three positions right now that are currently open. So I encourage, um, if you're interested, to take a look at our website at the BES website. Um, there's a if you scroll down, there's a an area at the bottom that says open positions. So we have the ombuds position. Um, the AGPA and the Senior Hazardous Substance Engineer position. Um, these positions were posted, I think, before I came on board, and um, we're just opening it up to see if there's other folks that would like to apply as well. We had a great pool of candidates, but just, uh, oh, okay. I'll, I'll stay right here. And um, I also wanted to just add a little bit about the importance of the ombuds position, um, who they'll have two staff underneath them. Like that's really our outreach to the community. And until we have those positions, we are not able to connect and do outreach as much as we would like to do. DTSC staff has, and public participation has been wonderful, has been just great. And we couldn't do these board meetings without all of you, um, but we also are looking forward to having the ombuds position as well as that whole team staffed up. Um, any questions about the hiring updates from board members? 
Okay. Um, contract updates. So we are excited to announce updates on two contract items. As you may know, on the June 10th board meeting, um, the board did approve $187,277.50 um, just being exact, for logistic design and facilitation services. And that contract went out to California State University um, of SAC, Sacramento, and they would provide meeting logistics, design, facilitation services, and that was executed on July 1st. And so they will be taking over um, many of the areas that DTSC has been helping us support for these meetings. So um, we look forward to working with them in the August meeting. Um, and I, I, I just wanted to comment, I remember at the June 10th meeting, there was a comment by um, board member Georgette, as well as from the public. And just to clarify, that that contract is really for logistics design and facilitation, but doing the community engagement and outreach, that is going to be the board staff. Like it's such an important piece that we want our board staff to be doing that. So I just wanted to clarify that because I know there are some questions about that contract. Um, second, we have our translation uh, contract. And so I wanted to note that the board has delegated authority to the executive officer for purchases and contracts up to $50,000 in value. And given that, that contract was reviewed by me and approved by me. So under that contract agreement, um, Cal interpretation and translation agrees to enter into a contract um, with us to provide interpretive translation services for the BES board uh, meetings going forward. And that will be a one-year term with the possibility of extension. Are there any questions from board members about that translation interpretive contract for 50,000? All right, okay. Um, so I will give my last update about the budget. Um, so since fiscal uh, year just ended, we don't have exact numbers on how much um, the board has spent. As, as we've mentioned before, oh God, these mics. Um, uh, the, the, as we mentioned before, the board just started getting up and running. And so we have projected amounts and this is an exact amount, this is an estimation and I will have more exact numbers for you all at our August board meeting. I'm not even, I'm not even moving. And okay, is this better? But then you can't hear me. They can hear you, okay. Um, so thus far, it's an estimate that we have spent about 600,000 um, through uh, June 30th. And again, I'll have more exact numbers for you all at the um, August board meeting. Um, and then I wanted to give an update about our upcoming budget for um, fiscal year 2022 to 2023. Um, so we have about two million and four four hundred thousand thirty. Sorry, two point four about roughly two point four million dollars for personnel services, and so that's the board members and the staff that will be hired for the board. So that's 15 positions. That includes um, salaries, wages, staff benefits. And we have about um, 191,000 in operating um, expenses and about another 375,000 on support budget to, again, help run these meetings, as well as all the work that the board does beyond these meetings, such as just communication, IT, et cetera. Um, do board members have any questions about the upcoming budget? I'll do a, a, a deeper dive with each board member about the budget and how, and get input on um, how all of you would like some of these funds kind of allocated as going forward, but yep. Any questions right now? No, my only comment on that, uh, just to reiterate and state for those who haven't heard it before, the overall budget for the board was approximately $3 million. That's what's pushed out from the from two of the accounts at DTSC. It's part of the uh, legislative mandate. We didn't get started last um, July 1st, 2021. So nothing significant was spent until the board came together or board appointments were made. So 
as having spent such a small part of our overall budget for 21-22, doesn't roll over. The state takes that back, it goes into the general fund. I will remind them of that when I testify before the legislature and see if they want to give any of it back to us. But generally speaking, that's the way it works, which made it very important for us to complete the contract with CSUS before the end of, of the last fiscal year so we could encumber it uh, during that period and give us a little bit more breathing room in this, um, in this calendar budget. Uh, the translation contract is in this year's budget. Moving forward, as we identify our needs and we can justify them, after we're staffed, after we've really been executing and performing and delivering, then we'll be in a position to say, yeah, that amount works, or no, it doesn't, and this is why, and this is what we need. So we'll be tracking that, both in terms of not just spending, Right? How are we spending and um, how are we meeting our budget? But are our needs and our mandates being met by the budget that was given us? And if not, why not? And what do we need to spend? So I always encourage everybody to be dream. What would you like to do? What would it cost to do it? We may or may not be able to, but I don't like to limit our thinking to what our budget is. Our budget may limit what we can do, but we shouldn't not be thinking about what we want to do. Um, if we, I'm not saying this is what we'd suggest, but there were uh, community members who said they wish this board met every month or that you met and then had community meetings or other outside activities. That include travel, hotel, time, staffing. If those things feel like a priority, I don't want us to lose track of that. I don't want us to... You know, I want to be able to go back to the legislature and really make a clear ask if that's what we need with justification as to why we're asking it. So I'm asking each board member to bear that in mind. Dream big, think about what it will cost, work with Swathi, and whether or not we can do that, but we shouldn't stop thinking. Have what? Having our meetings later. That and it may be concern. possible as we move into this next phase, and I know we'll, we'll discuss this with CSUS, some of, of the meeting timing was in part because of our access to the support staff from DTSC that were allocated to us and whether or not there was support for these meetings not being daytime. Uh, the second part of it just had to do with facility availability and board member availability. So we have a lot of things to juggle, but I think we should look at that. Yeah, and I, I assume that it would it would increase cost as well because facilities usually do charge more for right. for overtime and, and as well as staff. Yes. So there's a lot of factors. We've run into this when we've been at meetings, get out of there by five o'clock or you're in overtime, or you can't stay past 6 p.m. because of this. So we have to be strategic about it and responsive as well. Um, there were people who asked us to have weekend meetings or people that asked us to have evening meetings. I do think we have to find some accommodation, whether it's for our full board meetings or other um, convenings at times that are not 10 to 5 on a on a weekday. So I think we'll definitely um, ask Swathi to explore that because she's here and we can. Thank you. Just public comments about right. that agenda item. Okay, so we will now open public comment for um, regarding the executive officer's report. Um, if you would like to make the comment in person, um, you can complete a comment card. If you have dialed into our call-in line, um, the number, um, you can press star one to become, to get in the queue. Um, if you would like, and then please state your name and affiliation for the record. Um, you'll have two minutes to comment. Um, after... So if you want to express your comment in writing, you can send it to us at besinfo at bes.dtsc.ca.gov. Um, so 
Is there anyone who's joining us in person that would like to make a comment on this item? Okay, let me just check with the... And there's no one in queue on the call-in line, so we can um, move to board discussion? Or we already had that, so 10? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, agenda item 10, back in queue here, is the meeting calendar. And, uh, correct? Yes. Yes. Oh, and Alexis generously is going to walk us through that. The board has uh, posted and set its calendar for the rest of this year. And we are, on the 25th, as was mentioned this morning, going to be meeting in Sacramento and ideally workshopping um, public input and board discussion on the permit appeal regulations that the board is charged by statute to develop. On September 29th, we're planning to meet in the Bay Area and um, we'll formulate a more detailed area of focus around that. We'll be working in these cases with um, our Cal State University Sacramento contractor. And lastly, the last meeting of the year is set for November 15th. We're hoping to meet in the Central Valley and we're going to work on the logistics for that. What I'd like to do now is propose a series of dates for next year with the proviso that if these dates should conflict with other important um, plans, symposia, uh, conferences, and the like that you're aware of, we are open to making a shift, and you could forward that information to our executive officer, Swathi Sharma. And the 2023 meeting dates that we are provisionally going to consider for action today are January 26th, March 9th, April 27th, June 15th, June 20, excuse me, July 27th, September 7th, October 26th, and December 7th. I would um, be interested in the board's comment on that, and we can decide how we want to move forward. One question, uh, you notice that there are eight I just want to point out that there are eight dates. We're um, obligated by statute to have six with at least three outside of the Sacramento area. We've scheduled eight anticipating that we might have a permit appeals hearing, that we might have some other reason for convening um, and to just be more aggressive and assertive in our um, activities. So, uh, so that's why we have eight on the calendar and... Uh, we haven't determined times or spaces for those yet, and we're hearing proposals for other community activities. And it may be coming back to revisit communities um, that we've been part of. So I just wanted to comment really quickly. I know a lot of the community members, we've, we've heard this in a couple of meetings now, and a lot of the community members today also said that they would like meetings at times that they can attend. And part of the reason that this meeting um, has to be during the day is because it's a seven hour meeting. So if we start that at 6 p.m., um, you know, we're also not gonna have attendance at the end of the meeting. So having a, eight meetings uh, gives further opportunity to have shorter meetings um, and, then, and then have more time. That's a really good point. Thank you for that, Jessica. Hadn't thought about it that way. Excellent. Uh, and we felt like we have so much to catch up on, um, so much uh, undone work and so much administrative startup work. Uh, but I think your point's well taken. It would be, but we also fly everybody and um, for these convenings. So then you're, you're, you want to maximize your, your time, but you also seven, eight hour meetings get to be really hard for the communities and for us. So Swathi. Um, two things. One, I just wanted to reiterate what um, board member Alexis had mentioned that like organizations, if there is a, a conference or a symposium or a convening that's conflicting with these dates, um, especially the 2023 dates, please email me or the info email so that we can be aware of that and make changes. Um, and then already for the December, there was some questions about the December 7th date. And I think it, it does 
um, we may need to revisit that date. Um, so I am just putting that out there that we may need to do it either. The, the whole issue that we were arising on was um, with holidays, right? So we have Thanksgiving a little bit before and then we have Christmas afterwards. So just putting that out there that the December 7th date, date may not work for um, a few folks. So we may need to revisit that date. Um, and that the 2023 dates may be a little bit fluid depending on what we hear back from community members and organizations. Um, and to note that all of these dates are on a Thursday. Right. Which was a date that seemed to be more positively responded, responded to a day of the week, but we'll see. Fridays weren't a good idea. Mondays weren't good, you know, so. Uh, you said, um, I don't have any questions in regards to dates, but just, just wanted to really uh, try to, as we're trying to hold down the, the timing of it, just for us to keep in, to keep in mind the request to have uh, evening meetings, um, especially maybe on the meetings that we're having in the communities, yeah. perhaps at least those. Um, I think that's a good point. Just at least starting with right. those. <clears throat> so I think one of the things that we need to hear, I mean, we know we want to go to the Central Valley and we're tentatively scheduled that for this year. Uh, we need recommendations, invita not invitations to sponsor or host us, but community, either there's activities in a community or community groups that are particularly interested in us coming to their community. Um, I hope that in the outreach that we're all doing, we'll hear more about that. And then someone will come back and say, we should be up in Humboldt or we should be come back to a different part of Los Angeles or the San Diego area. So once we do that and we come back at the next meeting, if you use these dates as your marker, as you go out to talk to people and somebody says, God, April's a great time to come to, uh, then we could we could come back to these dates with times and locations. Does that make sense? Okay, so can I have a motion to... Did you have a comment, Jessica? No, do we have any public comments? No, she had said no. So if anybody joining us in person today, we are going to move into a public comment for the board member meeting calendar. Um, so uh, again, those joining us in person, if you would fill out a comment card or you can raise your hand if you have a comment for this particular agenda item. For folks who have joined us on the phone, each commenter will be given two minutes. Um, you can press star one to, con to join the queue during, um, and then you can also okay. provide your name and any affiliation at the prompt. Um, if you would like to withdraw your comment, you would press star two. If you would like to express your comment in writing, um, in writing only, please email us at BES info at bes.dtsc.ca.gov. Um, I see no hands in the audience, so I will check in with our operator to see if we have any callers in queue. Um, so there, we have no callers in queue, and I see no um, callers in person or uh, public in person that would like to comment. So uh, if you would like to move. Great. So uh, we've already uh, heard of a conflict for December 7th, see the value of having these conversations. So I'll invite a motion for the other seven dates from you, Alexis. Madam Chair, I move that we adopt the provisional 2023 Board of Environmental Safety calendar comprising January 26th, March 9th, April 27th, June 15th, July 27th, September 7th, and October 26th. Do we have a second? Georgette seconds. I'll second, Georgette. Any further discussion? Will you call the roll, please? Uh, Jeannie Rizzo? Yes. Sershma Bhatia? Yes. Georgette Gomez? Yes. 
Alexis Strauss Hacker. Yes. One more time. Yes. Uh, Lizette Ruiz. Yes. We have five ayes and no nays. The motion passes unanimously. Okay, the next agenda item is item 11, uh, where we would have reviewed and discussed uh, minutes from the previous meeting. However, they are have not been fully remediated and uh, posted yet, so that will be done at a future meeting. But that doesn't mean that you don't get to know what happened at that meeting, because what you can do is go to our website, bes.dtsc.ca.gov slash forward slash, and the meeting minutes will be up there, but also the videos of uh, those previous meetings are there if you uh, want to watch them and, and get caught up. So uh, May 3rd, May 19th, and June 10th will be, as well as these minutes, will be reviewed and be on the agenda for the next meeting in August. Thank you. Madam Chair, can we just remind folks where to find um, the webcasts of prior meetings? Is it on our BES website? Yes, it is. On our it's under website. past meetings. Uh, there may be a little reorganization of that site. We're hoping that the most current meeting will be the first thing people see, and then the other meetings will be in the in the batch below. Uh, and in general, we, we have some work to do on that BES website. Right now, it is... Um, functional at best, and we hope that it'll, there'll be more opportunities and more ways for people to engage through that site, but they are available there. Um, okay. We have time, right, Jess? Uh, How are we doing on time? Yeah, if you... Uh, yeah, we're good. We can go to the priority areas, right? I think so. Yeah. Did we approve our minutes? Wait, we, we don't oh, okay, have sorry, the minutes. Uh, That's okay. Really quickly, is priority areas going to be about how long? About At most. No, uh, a little more than that. No? And then discussion? Yeah. Okay. Maybe 20 minutes total. Okay, so, so one of the things that we... Okay, so four priority areas. Yes, that's what I thought. Okay, so now if you have been following us, we established some board priority areas, which are like subcommittees of the board, areas that the board, individual board members, either by their experience, their expertise, their interest, or their assignment, um, have agreed to focus on areas that are within our mandate. And they be, it, they'll become a standing agenda item where we have the board members and their priority areas listed um, on, the, on the agenda. So I'll go in order. Uh, and that doesn't mean that everything that they're working on needs to be reported on at every meeting. But it's a way for you all also to know who to reach out to if there's an area of your interest or your concern. So we want to put the areas alongside the board members' names, not just uh, their names. So um, we'll start with uh, Sushma Bhatia, and just reiterating so that we look at each other and agree that I've got this right. Um, Sushma is uh, responsible for uh, the assessment of um, uh, the uh, DTSC strategic plan with Swathi and myself, as well as designing the strategic planning for the board, including our metrics, uh, youth outreach, liaison to the Air Resources Board, and Cal Recycle. Correct? Okay. Yes. Forever engraved in stone. Do you want to go ahead? Sure. Okay. Uh, I'm going to spend most of my, my update talking about the strategic plan. In the past few board meetings, we talked about the importance of developing and communicating our strategic plan clearly. This is a document that would communicate what we hope to accomplish as a board. Um, and this is a document that's separate from DTSC's strategic plan. It would cover the what, the what of we the board will accomplish. 
in subsequent conversations with Jeannie and with Swati, we also agreed that through this plan, we would like to communicate our guiding principles as a board and our approach. This includes the specific activities with timelines and owners on how we plan to execute on our deliverables. Uh, we talked earlier about how transparency and accountability are the, are the key guiding principles that we're using. Uh, and in that spirit, we want to put this document out there. Uh, essentially, once this plan is developed, it would have both the what component and the how components together. So with this broad context in mind, uh, I had begun to work on a framework, which really is a document that would pull all these elements together. Uh, but through this process, it became clear that our role as a board, um, we in a very unique place because our strategic objectives are covered in SB 158. So 158 as a mandate clearly lays out what our strategic objectives are. Uh, this seems to be unlike other state boards that serve more as an oversight body for their agencies, uh, which means in some cases, let's go back again. So does this work? Yeah. Okay. So in some cases, those uh, boards don't have their own unique strategic plan that's different from the agencies they're overseeing. So I'm calling out here that we are in a unique position in that A, our strategic objectives are mandated, uh, and B, we have activities in this mandate that are above and beyond what DTSC would accomplish as an agency. Um, having said that, 158 is also not a consumable document that that our residents or communities can easily understand what it is that the board, we all are going to accomplish. So I, fi I feel that there is value in us building our own strategic plan that lays out more clearly the essence of one what 158 is mandating for us to do. Uh, and by definition, a strategic plan also talks about what we're not going to do because anything that's our, outside of the plan are activities that we may not have the capacity to take on. And that's why it's important for us all to take the time to understand what's in the document and be fully aligned before we put this out for, um, in the community. So that's my, my preamble on the strategic plan. Uh, and my proposal in terms of how we move forward is that we think about the strategic plan in two phases. So phase one would be the strategic objectives. Uh, these are objectives covered by the mandate where the mandate is very clear. That's 158. It would also provide clarity on topics that the that the 158 mandate is ambiguous about. So for example, I think environmental justice areas, it talks a lot, of, 158 talks about our intent to engage with uh, environmental justice communities, but it doesn't clearly spell out what exactly we're going to do by way of our uh, engagement with these communities. So this strategic plan becomes an opportunity for us to first communicate what's in 158 and also build on what is not written in 158 that we would like to take on. But that would be part of the first phase, which is the strategic plan phase. Uh, I think that there is um, a second phase to this, which I'm going to call the operating plan, which gets into, okay, if this is our strategic plan, the strategic plan says that we're going to propose a fee structure. Uh, the strategic plan says that we're going to introduce uh, and oversee a permit appeals process. But the how we're going to do those activities would be in an operating plan that would have timelines and, uh, to the extent possible, owners attached to them. So that is my proposal. Uh, any comments on this? And I have, I have follow-up asks as well. No, I want to thank you. And I, I want others to know how much uh, work uh, Sushman's been doing thinking about this, drafting and redrafting, and um, having discussions about it harmonizing it, but also uh, taking, the, you know, taking the board's leadership up a notch on this. So thank you for all the thought you've already put into it. And I know we're all looking forward to that first five-page document that you're dying to present. And I hope it'll be on the agenda for the next meeting. Thank you. I hope so, too. Right. Uh, any other questions or comments on this before I... Okay. Okay. okay, so, so far we talked about the two phases, right? Phase one being the strategic plan, it's mandate plus clarification of, of items that are not clearly covered in the mandate. Phase two being the operating plan that has more detail on the how. Um, Swati has generously offered 
for us to, for the two of us to set up individual meetings with the board members uh, because it's really critical to gather your input uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis before we start to put something out in the community. So I'm looking at Greg. Greg is nodding. So that's, we're good to have. Uh, just light up your tie, Greg. Just light it up. <laughs> we should discuss how that how that works, but yeah. Okay. So this is one of those sidebars Okay, our intent. Yeah. Right? Okay. Okay, so so could we, we have at least one action item now, which is for us, for Greg and Greg and I and maybe Swati to have a conversation yes. about how I can solicit input from each of the board members in the development of a strategic plan. Our intent is to land these meetings in the next month so that we have a draft that we can put out for the community's review and input uh, the next time we get together, which is August 25th. Okay, great. So the kinds of questions that, we'll, that I would like to gather information on is what areas you would individually like to see covered in the strategic plan? Because this document has to speak to us um, and not just the topic or areas we will own, but also has to be a living document that lives outside of our terms with the board. So what areas would, would you like to see covered in the strategic plan, um, including elements of what our purpose is? Um, this strategic plan in its current fo form covers not just the strategic objectives, but we would also like this, to use this to communicate our purpose and our guiding principles. So I'd like input from each of you on what you see our purpose and our guiding principles as, so that this becomes a collective, uh, collective product for, of all the board members. Greg is nodding. Okay. Yes. Yes. Same conversation. Yes. Uh, anything else that you, Jeannie or uh, Swati, would like to add regarding the strategic plan? No, I think the only other part that relates to strategic planning broadly is um, how we see it. Um, the strategic plan needs to include what our oversight of DTSC is. So those are mandates, but they're also how do we interconnect. In order to do that oversight, in order to fulfill Mandate X, there's a correlation or a connection to DTSC in some way, um, whether it's um, the evaluation of their uh, KPIs, their key performance indicator, their metrics, or uh, evaluation of the director's annual priorities or their strategic plan. So, so this how we do it, part two, has to establish that. And that may be um, various board members participating in certain aspects of that with different DTSC staff. And I think that has to be mapped out so that it doesn't become, it doesn't become just one or two of us sitting with Meredith and or uh, Francesca and coming back and reporting, but actually we have a roadmap of how we're going to do that. What are the key things that we're hearing from community that, because we have that responsibility and how that's being executed at DTSC and understanding it better so that we're, we're hearing it from all perspectives. So I think it's really important that our plan, um, that we don't just dial it in with answers, that we actually do the homework on each of the areas that we're mandated to, um, to fulfill. And I know there'll be a big burden on Swathi to uh, manage to that, but I think it's important that we, we say it. Yes, uh, Sushma, did you wanna respond before I say my comments? Uh, I want to do a, I'm agreeing with what Jeannie is saying. 
uh, I think this first phase is about setting the guardrails yeah. in which we operate. And then phase two will be about what's in the guardrails, the specific details. And then Liz made the point earlier about how we're getting input from the community. And we can now start to look at this lens of the strategic plan to more clearly communi communicate with the communities what we're able to achieve within the confines of our mandate and our strategic plan and what areas we would have to maybe work with DTSC to um, accomplish. Um, I just wanted to say a few comments. One, the strategic planning process, it's going to be an iterative process. It's going to take some time because we want to be intentional and we want to be thoughtful on how, how we do this. Um, I look at the strategic plan as one, not only the mandates that need to be implemented, which is the what, but the strategic options on how. That's where we, we have SB 158, but the how is strategically us thinking with input from the various community stakeholders and public on how it's done. And so that iterative process, I hope, will involve um, workshopping and engagement where we are getting input um, on on the how, since we have the what, but um, but I just want folks to know that this isn't just going to be a a plan that you know we put out at the next um, uh, board meeting. This is going to be a process, and it's going to take some time. And the reason is is because we want to be very thoughtful and very intentional in 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 the how. Thank you, and I, I reminded periodically that I think. CARB or the Water Board, one or the other of them have been around for 50 years. So they, we've been around for five months. And so we have to bear in mind our youth and that will be growing in our understanding, knowledge, and ability to execute. So it's got to be a living document, uh, something that as we grow into it and we learn more and we see areas to be attentive to, that we revisit this. This isn't a static document that's going to guide us for the four years or two years of our tenure. This is something that's going to um, continue to live and breathe and grow. And also we'll make mistakes in there. I, I really hope not too many, but uh, we will look at something and say, why are we doing that? That's, that's, that's not the best use of our time and skills. Again, bearing in mind the limitations of our scope, right? How much time each of us has to put in and the amount of staffing that we have. So uh, our ambitions are significant and our capacity will get as close to our ambitions as they can. So I, I just want to remind us all of that. The other piece that I wanted to add is um, what I'm looking at the strategic plan is to also hold the board and board staff accountable. Um, so I'm going to be using, that's how I'm going to be looking at it is, is accountability. And in two forms, one, again, not only on what we've committed to um, community and the public, but SB 158, but then also making sure that we're not over promising and under delivering. So thank you. Uh, did you have any other area or was that really your report today? Um, I can speak 30 for 30 seconds about the conversations, ongoing conversations with the ARB um, EO's office. So one of my duties as uh, Jeannie laid out was to, is to liaise with the, the Air Resources Board. Uh, we've had productive uh, conversations about joint areas um, of collaboration. Uh, so some areas we talked about were metal shredders and processing technologies and businesses that release uh, VOCs uh, and uh, how we might maybe jointly host a meeting or at least review each other's strategic plan to understand the areas of overlap. We talked about green chemistry. You know, as you all may know, the Air Resources Board cares about driving the usage of uh, low VOC products. Now with DTSC's mandate on safer uh, consumer products, there might be an inter intersection on how we think about green chemistry. Uh, we talked about brake, brake equipment and brake pads, um, the fact that they release particulate matter. And as we move towards electrification of vehicles, the, the pollution released from brake equipment becomes more significant area of concern. And then fourthly, most importantly, we talked about areas of overlap being environmental justice communities. Uh, 
ARB has um, a, a bill, a uh, 617 mandated program around community air protection. So how might we maybe jointly think through the communities that ARB will focus on and what role we can play together with them in those communities. So again, this is a very initial conversations. There's a lot more work we can do and need to be doing to build a stronger connection with ARB. That's great. As a reminder, we've been talking about intersectionality, right? How do we do that? There's an EJ group here. There's an EJ group there. There's community outreach. There's how do we think about opportunities to pull those together? Uh, the other piece is duplication. One of the mandates is to look at, um, is there, are we duplicating across different um, programs within the department? And, and, and duplication can just mean things are done twice, or they can mean that you result in conflict because you've got two different um, programs uh, working on the same thing, but maybe only part of it. So I encourage all of the liaisons to the other BDOs to be thinking of those two things. It, where's the intersectionality and where's the duplication? Um, just so that we can hold that when we come back to think about where we can have a positive impact. So those two things I think are really important and um, they've come up over and over. So thank you for that. Um, I was going to say something. It's almost, I don't know, sometimes I don't think coincidence happen by accident, but um, as, as Swathi mentioned, one of the participants at our toxic tour was a representative from the South Coast Air Quality Management District who was actually um, the community liaison to AB 617. And so he, <laughs> he mentioned that and he was trying to talk about, you know, what overlap and, and the tour itself got him thinking about overlap and, and, you know, how to. So maybe it's something that we should reach out to when, with every, you know, community we, we meet with tried to reach out with the local AB 617 um, reps. And what was his name? Was that Tish? Nish. Nish. So let's get his name for you um, and for Georgette. I think that's important. I'm happy to learn about that. Great. Um, Georgette. Georgette is environmental sorry, sorry. justice. I, I just wanted, are we okay on time yeah. for a break? We. Okay. We can continue. Okay. Okay. Um, and and we've we've spoken before about we'll have an office of ombuds that will be part of that um, intersect. And um, so let me see. Uh, there's also still not quite the clarity that we all desire, but I understand it's coming um, as to the EJAC, um, the the environmental justice adverse advocacy committee that um, sits at DTSC and how we connect to that. I think I think Yvonne is still new and they're still developing that, but those all fall in your purview. So talk to us. Yep. Um, so I, um, and just to I think one thing that came yesterday from the from the tour was um, talking about intersectionality and this is before I go into my report actually but um, was the possibility of also working with CARB or the local um, air resources boards on data collection that they're acquiring on air pollution to help us, whatever overlap we can take from that. Mm -hmm. So you just reminded me when you mentioned the outreach to CARB just to consider as well. Um, but in terms of the, the work that I've been working on, um, and this also has been in conjunction with LIS. Um, and, and Swati has been part of the conversations, is how do we, uh, one of the mandates on, on the bill is to create a, um, a environmental justice um, advisory group committee, whatever we're going to end up calling it, and what is their role and who is supposed to do it and, and who is not. So we're trying to figure all of that out. Uh, we started a conversation with Ivan Casares, who is the environmental justice uh, director at uh, DTC, uh, DTC 
oh my gosh, the, uh, the Department of Toxicity, the TSC, but it's been a long day. Um, and uh, so we're just trying to figure out all of that and, and figure out the jurisdictions and the responsibilities, um, what's the intersectionality, what is not the intersectionality, uh, right? Uh, but aside from that, in terms of structure, we're, we're also looking at, because the community has been engaged for many, many, many years, and we know this, and they've given a lot of input already. So we're trying to uh, extrapolate that, that history as well. So we're not starting from scratch and go to the community, say, hey, tell us again, right? Uh, so we're trying to be mindful of being, um, recognizing their input already. Um, so we're, we're doing a little bit of background history on this whole conversation about um, inquiring and validating the environmental justice voice into the over uh, our oversight, um, and uh, and then one of the things that we want to do eventually, as soon as we figure out who's who's guiding what and who's how who, who's responsible for what, we do want to take it to the community so the community is also helping us shape this, envi this environmental justice uh, platform that we will be creating. So we're hoping to do a workshop, workshop it as well once we understand kind of like where we are and what we need to do. So that's where we are right now. That's perfect. And I know that... Um to your point, Georgette, about how involved the communities have been in their communities for decades, they also were really involved in the reform. And I think um, uh, everybody's been shared the reports that were provided by various, by Center for Race, Poverty, and the Environment in particular, and I know you all got those, uh, all the deep work that groups did um, in support and challenges of the creation of this board and our mandate. Uh, so I think it's so really wanna, important, yes. a deep review of that, mm -hmm. uh, to your point, right. that we want to be mindful of that, that, that history, right? right? And how can it shape, shape us, creates a platform to take it back in solidify it. Right, so, so we're that's not asking we are that right first now. question. No, again. we're not. We're not yet. So yeah, so we are doing our due diligence right now um, in terms of the department itself and our role to try to figure out the the, the synergy and, and, and where, where we align in the areas that we're not going to align because there's going to be both, right? And then figure out, okay, within all of that, um, go back to the history of the communication between the community already before we even get their input because we want to be mindful of acknowledging their input already and it's there. So we're doing a little bit of digging through all that and uh, putting it into some sort of form where we can then go back to the community and say, okay, this is where we are. Does it make sense? Uh, how should it look like? And then bring it back. So it's going to take some time. Um, but we also want to be mindful that it's a it's a significant aspect of developing our roles, uh, acknowledging the community. Perfect. And just as a reminder, the Center for Race, Poverty, and the Environment and other groups in their coalition are working on a paper on e environmental justice metrics um, for assessment of DTSC's programs. So uh, we should have that by the end of the summer at some point, and Ingrid has, Ingrid Brostrom has, um, uh, is working on that and is the lead on that. And I think that'll also be a very incredibly useful for both strategic planning and the development of your EJ platform. So um, thank you. Okay, uh, let's see, Alexis. Uh, Alexis is, um, what do I have here? No, I, I know I know everything you do. I've, I've got, okay. She's liaison to the Department of Defense, um, the Water Board, the Ocean Pollution Council. Protection Council. Protection Council, uh, and working um, with Lizette on permit appeals. And uh, we have more tasks for you going forward, but talk to us. Okay. Um, I reached out to Department of Defense, and there's nothing new since we last met, but I will note that at DTSC, the Deputy Director, Carolyn Godkin, who had been the main point of liaison on a monthly and quarterly basis with DTSC, um, has departed, and I'm keen to pick up the thread with whomever takes on that portfolio. And if next year we should have a San Diego-based meeting, um, it would be great to maybe look at the DTS, excuse me, the DOD 
portfolio. They have seven of 100 um, RICRA Part B operating permits and things like that. So there's a unique aspect to the federal facility portfolio. We'll come back to that another time. To pull together two facets of the Water Board portfolio and the Ocean Protection Council um, with our interests as the board, in the last month or so since we met, there's been a lot of interest um, in working with tire manufacturers, not unlike maybe 15 years ago, the work with brake pad manufacturers around copper um, loadings. There's now an interest in the components as taken up by DTSC and the Ocean Protection Council and the Water Board in looking at how a couple of things that make tires perform better, last longer, are also highly toxic to salmonids. And is there a way, as was shown in the brake pad partnership, that one can use the different tools available to us on the West Coast to maybe drive um, improvements in tire manufacture um, that also reduce the loadings to West Coast fisheries? So that's the short version of that. But the longer version is, um, depending on how we structure our Oakland agenda in September, there might be an opportunity for all of those agencies to join our workshop and talk about the impacts of communities that ring the bay. That's great. Then. Good. I have instruction. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, I see. Okay, great. Um, and, and we have more for you in just a minute. Um, uh, Lizette? Uh, Lizette is, um, uh, works with uh, Georgette on environmental justice and, as we know, was a big part of organizing one of the tours or all of the tours yesterday. Um, and But permit appeals, hazardous waste, they go to both her interest and expertise. And I know we, we have things coming up on the permit appeals process in particular. We don't have a permit appeal to deal with right now, but that doesn't mean we won't um, within the coming months. And we know that August 25th we'll be workshopping it. So do you want to report out on your priority areas? All we really much, all, all I have to say regarding the permit appeals is that uh, we recently met with folks that are familiar with the, the process who, who have been involved in one way or another uh, with permit appeals so that we can get all our questions answered. Let's go back a little bit. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So that we can get. Can I, can I just clarify? So there are people that weren't in. They they know about permit appeal, but they were not involved in oh, permit okay, appeal. Sorry. Just to just to make it <laughs> crystal clear. Okay, so so they were familiar with the process, but not involved with the process. Sorry, I thought it was just currently involved, yeah. but um, and so the importance of that is just to have a a a, a clear view of the process and um, really to to increase our understanding on the process because it's something that, that as you all know, it, it, it is going to take a, a lot of our time in the near future. And so we had a, a, a meeting that we didn't really finish. <laughs> so it, it's going to have to continue uh, because it, it, this, yes. And so, um, we're hoping to, you know, to, with this understanding, to be better equipped to to communicate with the public on the at the next meeting on August 25th. So we really do want to encourage the public to participate, to, for the, you know, organizations to participate in in this process. And um, yeah, that that's pretty much it with hazardous waste management plan. We we're also um, still on you know getting onboarded on that process as well. There have been a series of workshops that are set out, um, so I do encourage everybody to also sign up for those. Um, we are pretty much getting the same um, trainings that are are available online um, with perhaps a little more in depth and in a little more one on one um, interaction. And um, it, it they honestly. Um, went through really fast for me personally because <laughs> they're, I don't know why they just seem very interesting, but it, it's really important to really understand how the baseline report for how hazardous waste is managed and to really um, um, be able to, you know, make sure that all data gaps are, are with the information that's being accumulated is identified so that um, we, along with the public can, can really, you know, look in and at the, at the plan that's going to be developed, and uh, we're going to have to, you know, start having meetings on 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 
on this pretty soon. So, Great. Thank you. Uh, Swathi is oversighting just about everything. Uh, that's her... That's her new executive officer um, role. Uh, we're working, uh, she and I will work on um, really digging into the whole fee structure issue. It's not something we have an immediate urgency, um, but we need to understand it. As you know, there was a... Um, there, there was a modification, in, a one-time modification in fees that allows for us to go forward now, but we need to evaluate the fee structure and um, have the mandate and purview to recommend uh, changes there. Is there anything you want to add to what uh, working with all of us on each of the areas? So thank you for that. Um, the one thing that I think we can do at the same time because it's all in this category, is priority areas, including the vice chair vote. Oh, yeah, we need to break by four. We need to go what? We need to have a break. We just need to finish up the board priority areas. And, and that then doesn't we include, will, okay. Yeah, we will. Okay, fine. I just wanted to get one more thing. I know, I know. Okay, so uh, we are going to open up right now for public comments on uh, board member priority areas. Um, so if anybody joining us in person has a comment on this item, again, board member priority areas, um, you can raise your hand and we will call upon you to make a comment. You will have two minutes to do so. Uh, for folks joining in on the... Uh, on the call-in lines, you will press star one to join the queue. You will state your name and affiliation for the record, um, and then we will call upon you to make your comment. If you would like to withdraw your comment at any, at any time, you can press star two. And if you would like to express your comment in writing only, um, you can email us at besinfo at dtsc.ca.gov. Um, so we do have one uh, caller in the queue. So Holly, if you would please um, go ahead and allow that person to express their comment. Cynthia Babich, you may go ahead. Uh, I just want to say I know that you guys are doing your best. It looks, I mean, I think you're trying, but this process set up for us being able to engage with you is so wonky that I'm not going to be able to continue on, which is a shame because I know you want people to be engaged with you. But I've been trying to comment pretty much this, you know, last half. And so um, I have some concerns around setting meeting times and dates without engaging with stakeholders that you know are interested in the process. As an example, um, DTSC is having a hazardous waste um, workshop or communication, or they're going to be telling us what they're going to do moving forward with that. Um, I participated in the committee, and it's a very serious issue to my community, and it very much conflicts with um, a workshop that we're doing. And so the public participation specialist knows me personally, could have reached out, and so that leads me to the next piece of community involvement and in being too reliant on DTSC and its public participation process because it's not working, quite frankly. And so um, I understand when you're getting established, there's a lot of things to get in place. But you really need to, these relationships that you started building with, those are the people that you need to um, keep reaching out to. And the same with contracts with Sac State. I'm sure they have really great um, resources, but that's the same contractor DTSC and other people use. And this oversight board, or maybe that's the wrong term, but that's what I see you as being, needs to be a little bit um, detached. And the last thing that I would say is that 
Um, I know Ingrid puts things in nice little packages for people to read, but um, she's part of the problem, in my opinion, in displacing the voices of real impacted community members. And I just want you to be aware that it's not going to be the low-hanging fruit that's dangling right in front of you that you're going to want to hear from. So um, I'll hang on a little bit more, but this process really is driving me crazy and needs to be fixed. So thanks. Well, thank you, Cynthia, for hanging in. Uh, one of the reasons we wanted to post all of the potential upcoming dates for 2023 and indicated that those were changeable. If there's anything on any um, community or organizational calendars that cause a conflict, this gives an opportunity to hear about it. In terms of uh, how DTSC handles its um, business and scheduling, I don't think we're in a place to comment on that. But uh, we do have a lot to get through to get to the place where we could have succinct four-hour meetings uh, as we're starting up and have a lot of administrative work. So thank you for bearing with us. Your input is, uh, is valuable, as always. Um, I just wanted to comment about the, the call-in process part of it. It's been um, challenging for us um, having it being the first off-site meeting. And um, a lot of the sites that we were looking at are still on skeletal staff because of COVID. And so even just finding a place that was webcast enabled where somebody could call in was, it's been a real challenge for us and we hope that it goes smoother um, in the future where it's not two separate like YouTube links and then a separate call in. We completely understand that it's it's been challenging and it's been, um, it, it's just been hard to find a facility that could um, provide all of those logistical pieces, but we're hoping that the next few off-site meetings um, are run a little bit more smoothly in terms of call-in engagement and participation. Okay. Um, I think we'll wrap up that part of the agenda and move on now. Um, we've covered everybody, correct? Um, is a discussion of the possible appointment So for those of us joining on the webcast, uh, we're taking a 10 minute break and we will meet back at uh, 4.11 p.m. Hello everybody, welcome back. Do you have a nice break? Okay. So I just want to, uh, as we come back from break, reestablish that we still maintain quorum with uh, member Ruiz, member Rizzo, member Strauss Hacker, member Batian, member Gomez. Great. Okay, so the next agenda item, if I'm correct, and I'm sure I'll be corrected if I'm not, is item 14, uh, which is discussion and possible action about the appointment of a vice chair. Uh, I think I mentioned at the, at the last meeting, and you heard it again today, that each of the priority areas of work for the board, um, there's a second person working with them on that. One, it's a more collaborative process. It expands the process, but it also allows for redundancy and clarity about who will pick up what in the event that someone's not available um, to take care of something. So I think those of you who've been at this meeting have seen um, Alexis Hacker um, track these meetings with a, a level of diligence to come to conclusion of action items at the end. She contributes to uh, future agenda items and has been that person, in my view, that in the event that I tested positive yesterday and couldn't be here. We'd need someone to chair the, the meeting. And the person who, someone who will track that going through the entire process, be aware and familiar and able to do that. So given that, um, I would like to nominate um, Alexis uh, to be the vice chair. Alexis serves at the pleasure of the governor, as do I. That was part of the consideration that it be a, a one of the governor's appointees. Alexis has a two-year appointment, so that's an opportunity at the end of two years for us to rotate that uh, that position, and it gives us uh, a backup 
uh, give some comfort to uh, Swathi that she knows that the event, for whatever reason, I couldn't chair a meeting or take a responsibility for that. And we can designate the vice chair to represent in a different way. So I'm nominating, um, I'm asking for a nomination and Okay, um, I'll, I'll be happy to make the the, nom the motion to uh, create the vice chair and nominate Alexis. I think it's a great idea right? Um, and a good process. So thank you for that. Thank, thank you. you. Is there a second for that? This is Liz Reese. I second. And if Lizette? I could, I would third too. <laughs> say, say that again. Uh, this is Liz Reese. I second. And if I could, I would third too. Oh, you, she would second and third. So we have a new parliamentary procedure here. Robert's, <laughs> Robert's Rules of Order revised. Uh, we have a third. Uh, <laughs> And a fourth, okay. Well, we're going to be Apparently, soon, so. I have a feeling this vote's going to be unanimous, but first we'll, we'll allow for um, to hear from any community members who want to comment on our appointment of a vice chair to the Board of Environmental Safety. Again, so um, those joining us in person can raise their hand to provide comment. Um, for those of us who have joined on the uh, call-in line, you can press star one to join the queue. Um, you can press star two, um, I'm sorry, you can state your name and affiliation at the prompt. And then if you would like to withdraw your comment at any time, you can press star two. Again, if you would like to express your co um, your comment in writing only at any time throughout this process, you can email besinfo at bes.dtsc.ca.gov. Um, each commenter will be provided two minutes and we'll be told when there are 30 seconds remaining and when time expires. So we will, I am not, I do see a hand. So I will um, please uh, come to the podium, state your name and affiliation for the record, and you will have two minutes. Yes, uh, my name is Sophia Collier and I'm a community volunteer and I've been uh, watching the board meetings um, online and also today and I just think that this is a great idea to um, uh, choose um, ch uh, board member Hacker as a vice chair. She really has shown the dedication. I think she'll be a great vice chair. So thank you. Thank you for that observation and that support. And we have no one in queue on either one of the call-in lines, so uh, we can move forward with a vote. Great, thank you. Is there any further board discussion? I will, of course, ask uh, Alexis Hacker if she'll accept this uh, appointment. If I would gladly. Thank you, Madam Chair. She will. Uh, can you call the roll, please? I will, Madam Chair. Jeannie Rizzo? Yes. Shoshma Bhatia? Yes. Georgette Gomez? Yes. Alexis Strauss-Hacker? If I can vote for myself, yes. If I'll abstain. Every, uh, everybody else does. I don't think there's a problem with that. Was that Ruiz? We'll figure out the rules about uh, whether you need to abstain, but regardless, it's unanimous. Yes. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Alexis, for agreeing to do that. Uh, so following um, that, uh, that routine at the... Um, uh, at this point in the meeting, um, Alexis has been taking notes on uh, key action items that came out of this meeting. Uh, so she'll she'll present those. We'll add or subtract or elaborate on any of them that are important. And if any of them rise to the level of appropriate as a future agenda item, we'll flag that or ask any board member to flag an item that they believe should be on a future agenda. So uh, I'll turn the uh, mic over to Alexis. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, I welcome edits and additions um, under our action items, and then later I'll follow with um, new agenda items for future board meetings. Under action items, our meeting convened here in the Montebello City Hall and a quorum was established. Um, following our tours yesterday, July 11th, board members will write up their personal report and submit it to our executive officer prior to August 11th, which is two weeks prior to our next board meeting, which will enable translation and posting. 
Board members are going to follow up with each of the community organizers with whom we met yesterday, whether the organization or the individual, as is appropriate. That um, comes forward again in a moment. Um, board member Batia is going to propose a format to our executive officer for us board members to use um, in follow-up from our tours yesterday. And in that, we will try and capture the key input we heard and any particular requests that were made of us as a board. Our executive officer approved the translation services contract as was described in agenda item 12. We adopted a provisional 2023 calendar of seven meetings with the notion of being willing to move that to accommodate other community and organizational meetings that we at this early date would not be aware of yet and urge people to be in touch with our executive officer if they wish to have us move any of those. Uh, let's see. Board member Batia and our current attorney and our incoming attorney, the two Gregs, are going to discuss how to go forward with Bagley Keene compliant outreach to us board members on the strategic plan so that we can engage with one another around three entities, the strategic objectives, our purpose, and our guiding principles, ideally for discussion at our August board meeting. And lastly, uh, the board moved to establish the vice chair position um, and to appoint me as the vice chair for the balance of my two-year term. In terms of new agenda items, um, I captured four. We're going to, one, queue up issues from yesterday's tours because some of them will involve having reached out to those who hosted us where there are it's of such significance that there are just continuing reasons for the board to revisit it. Um, and I have some um, details from that that board members had raised. At our July uh, board meeting, no, this is our July board meeting, excuse me, at our August 25th board, no, let me start all over. Item two, we plan to introduce our incoming board attorney, Greg Forrest, at our next meeting. Thirdly, at our next meeting, our executive officer will present um, an updated budget recap of the 2021-2022 budget numbers as best as they can be um, provided. Our chair urged us board members to consider priority activities to fund in this new state fiscal year. Your words were to dream big, and we will uh, work with our executive officer um, with our ideas. And to forecast our August um, agenda items, we expect they will include um, our workshopping of the permit appeal reg development and the strategic plan development. I will write those up and send them to our EO. Great. Uh, let's start with um, any board, uh, further board input or discussion, anything that you want to add or amend or in any way comment on on the action items and those that will flow into the next agenda. Hearing no comments from the board members, correct? Um, are there any um, public comments on future agenda items? So at this time, we are opening up public comments um, for future agenda future meeting agenda items. If any of our um, public members joining in person have a comment on this item, please raise your hand. Um, if you have joined us on the phone, please dial star one to join the queue. Please state your name and affiliation for the record. And then um, if you would like to comment just in writing today, you can also email us at besinfo at bes.dtsc.ca.gov. Each commenter will be provided two minutes. Um, so at this time, do we have anybody joining us in person who would like to make a comment on um, regarding future agenda items? Seeing none, I will look to our operators to see if we have any on either of our English or Spanish call-in lines. No. 
Okay, we're uh, coming close to a closing. I had a quick um, thought um, of maybe perhaps having a space to reach out to or, or, or publicly ask, send an ask to community organizations to, you know, meet with us. It's the same way somebody, um, you, you know, at the last meeting, CBE publicly invited us to the, you know, to the toxic tour. If there's a space in the agenda uh, where we can um, have that specified so that any uh, organization that will be at the next, um, within the area of our next meeting, um, perhaps, you know, make that invite. I like that idea. And what about it being a standing agenda item? Are there invitations for the board to join whatever stakeholder group, um, community organizations, individual sites, um, uh, permitted um, regulated entities uh, within our scope, our sphere. So I think we can add that. I'm as looking a, at Greg. Is that fine? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Any other comments? Okay. So now it's time for uh, closing comments from the uh, board members and uh, and then thank yous, correct? And open public comments on items that were not on the agenda. Okay, so at this time we are uh, reopening agenda item number two to allow for further comments from the public. Um, so agenda item two is for items that are not on the agenda. Um, so if anybody joining us in the audience today would like to make a comment regarding um, items not on the current agenda, please raise your hand. Um, and if there's anyone joining us in the calling um, lines, please press, press star one to uh, make your comment you will say your name and affiliation um, and then be provided two minutes to comment. So is, um, I will look to our um, in, to our operators to see if there are anybody in either of the Spanish or English queues to determine um, if we have any commenters. Uh, no commenters for this item. Great. Okay, thank you. Um, closing comments, uh, Lizette. I'd like to thank everybody who participated today and, and took the time off to make it here. We, we understand that in, uh, it's not always easy to be able to step, step out of our homes, to step out of our jobs, to participate in something that is, is really important for, for our communities, for our families. Um, and I'm truly grateful for everybody who shared their information, who shared their knowledge, who shared their comments with us and I, I hope that you will continue to work with us. It's very important to me as somebody, you know, from this community, from this area, that we all work together, that we keep pushing each other to 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 work to make our environment cleaner for, for our future, for our children, for our families. And um, thanks, thanks to everybody who helped us with the toxic tours yesterday for, for the folks with uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility and CBE who, who helped plan the tour I was in. I'm eternally grateful and, and for all the participants who were there with us. And um, thanks to all the DTSC staff who've helped us. I, I can't express my gratitude, um, but um, I'm eternally grateful for, for all your time and patience with me personally. <laughs> but um, yeah, and, and thanks to all the other board members. I, I really appreciate your presence and, and your sacrifices. Thank you. Thanks. Swathi? Well, as we know, there's a lot of people behind the scenes that uh, these board meetings happen. And as I mentioned to you, we thanked all the organizations that helped us with the tours yesterday. But I also wanted to um, individually um, thank and identify a number of, of folks that have really helped not only with today, 
um, but also with yesterday's tours and logistics. Um, so first off, I wanted to just identify the folks that helped with yesterday's tour and logistics. And uh, apologies if I mispronounce anybody's name. Um, Teresa Garcia, Laura Castillo, Mahogany Christopher, Tracy Fuerte, Madia Jamal, Mehdi Batihar, Jeff Mueller, Dion Falk, Kim Smith, Shannon White, um, Bettina Bergren, and then for today's um, board meeting, DTSC staff, Patrice Bowen, Adam Cal Cavillo Kane, Matthew Cummings, um, Jerry Diedrich, Renee Re uh, Dion Falk, Tracy Fuerte, um, Suze Houston, um, Elsa Lopez, Manuel Lopez, Greg Lyle, Catherine Pitts, Helio Rodriguez, um, Jenny Sanchez, Chin Chow, Kim Smith, Mahogany uh, Smith Christopher, Christy Spotswell, Jessica Swan, and the City of Montevallo staff, um, Israel Cervantes, um, uh, Michael Chi, Sean Granger, Alfredo Perez um, Negron, Vincent Tran, Focus Interpretation, Brittany um, Caradinas, and Sergio Morales. And also just wanted to uh, loop back to the City of Montebello staff. Um, thank you again for uh, allowing us to have the space. I know that there were a couple of um, meetings along the way. I know that there was a, a lightning incident here that happened during one of prior to the meetings. And um, and so thank you again for all of the folks that have helped to make this happen. And then we also look forward to CSUS and thank you Arit for attending today. And we look forward to um, facilitating the meetings going forward. And I would just like to give a personal thank you in addition to City of Montebello for, for hosting us today and um, and all of my colleagues at DTSC that have uh, supported and gotten us um, through uh, these last couple of amazing meetings. I would also like to shout out um, our Verizon operators today. So Michelle, Victor, Holly, and Valerie, who have done a great job of facilitating in the background. And I know you only hear them, but they're, they're doing amazing work also. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, Alexis. Madam Vice Chair. Oh, heavens. Um, I'm grateful to everyone who hosted yesterday's tours to our board, to the staff. Thank you. Sushma. Thank you, City of Montebello, DTSC, East Yards, and the Assembly member, um, Miguel Santiago's office. Uh, thank you for the wonderful host. And um, I think personally, I want to share that this opportunity to tour the communities and meet with them has been really impactful. As I look at the strategic plan, I see a very large and sizable charter in front of us, and I worry about how the few of us at this table are going to pull this all together. And it's these conversations with the community, understanding the impact of our work that's um, motivating for, for us all to progress forward. So thank you. Georgette. Yeah, I also just want to express my, uh, my gratitude uh, to everybody that has been mentioned. I do want to just add uh, one more person to that list, and that is uh, Laura Castillo, who was part of the DTSC, uh, who was uh, who picked us up and drove us around to do our tour and allowed us to to participate. And uh, uh, Swati, thank you for really being the shepherd of putting everything together along with DTSC. Thank you. Great, thank you. And we we said goodbye to Greg Lyle today, but I would be remiss not to uh, acknowledge that. Jessica Swan and the team that has supported us sitting in the back row there and at the tables and outside um, are shifting out of their role. Uh, and we're going to miss you all. We welcome the opportunity to work with CSUS, but uh, having DTSC provide us with the A staff, the A team, and saying you can have the A team for your meetings and 
coming from wherever you flew from or drove from to be here uh, and your willingness to come in over weekends and stay late in the evening and be sending us emails at midnight, uh, Jessica, um, and expecting a response. Uh, <laughs> but that's the part that's just amazing. And uh, But really, it's it's been a pleasure and joy, and I know we we... We are eternally grateful uh, that you all stepped up with joy and commitment. It wasn't like you got assigned and you had to do it. You really stepped in and gave us your best, and it has meant the world to us. So I thank you for that. And on that note, um, I need a motion to adjourn this meeting. Oh, Greg wants to say something. Public comment from Greg Public Lyle. Com Public comment. <laughs> um, as, as we've said, this is my likely my last meeting with the board. Um, it's not a particularly happy meeting. I've really enjoyed working with all of you. I want to thank you for tolerating me. I know that at times I can be pain. Um, <coughs> I've been impressed with the board. I've been impressed with your dedication to the board and with your curiosity about how the board works, how DTSC works. It's really, it's it's really been impressive. I, 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 I've really learned to appreciate your your commitment to the mission, and I think the board as an as an entity is very well served by having the five of you here. I think, I think, DTSC is well served by having the five of you on this board, and quite frankly, the state of California, because I think this board is capable of doing some really incredible things because of the five of you. And, um, and on a personal note, not that I, maybe that was personal note as well. I've just, I have thoroughly enjoyed working with the chair. Jeannie, you're, you're fantastic to work oh, with. Yeah. So oh. having you. said that, on good that, luck. Well, I guess I uh, good things from when the tears come, it's time to adjourn the meeting, <laughs> right? It has been, um, a complete joy for us. Uh, to be calling you at all hours of days, weekends, times off with <clears throat> what seem like silly questions but turn out to be really important ones that you've done the homework and research to guide us so that we um, stay not just in compliance but be thinking strategically and, uh, you know, in, in terms of the bigger picture at DTSC. So um, I think this is a love fest to end the meeting. And on that note... Uh, do we have the motion to adjourn? Madam I Chair, think, uh, I move to adjourn. Okay, Alexis I, I second. Moves. So Alexis moves, uh, Member Batia, sorry, Member Strauss Hacker moves, uh, Member Batia has seconded, and um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting's adjourned. Thank you all so much. Oh, wait. <laughs> <laughs> that was the vice chair. I did not do it. <laughs> This concludes today's conference. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time.